Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this meeting of the Budget and Finance Committee for Monday, October 26th. Um, I'm Paul Krikorian, Chair of the Committee. I'm joined by my colleagues, Mr. Blumenfield and Mr. Kretz, and uh, we're expecting Mr. Bonnet shortly, so we're going to be ready to begin. Um, members, I'd, well, first, if there's anybody who would like to offer public comment other than Mr. Spindler, um, you can fill out one of these white cards and bring it forward. Um, members, I would have offered items 6, 7, and 8 as consent items, but we do have cards on those from said Mr. Spindler. So I'd like to invite him to come up and take three minutes to comment on those items. 6, 7, and 8. Oh, 6, 7, and 8. Okay. That's good. Item six, Dr. Sung what? Son. to the Los Angeles City Employees Retirement System, Board of Administration. Nobody really knows what this board does. I've never seen it. I've seen it on the internet. But if it does exist, then definitely Dr. Sung what? Son. would be a good choice to be put on there, good to go to get more Asian people representative in the city. The decades of discrimination are over. Now we get to item seven, New York Mellon Trust, and again, a great, great bank. Nothing better than these big banks. They are so trustworthy. So of course we should be doing business with these New York banks because we wouldn't want to hire local banks to be doing business with city businesses in the city of Los Angeles. That, that would be job creation here, and that would be irrational to the city council. So we need to give that work to New York instead of Los Angeles. We have banks here in Los Angeles, but you don't want to do business with them. You want to do business in New York because New York is where they hide all the money and finagle all of the insider trading. Now we have, oh, item eight. Now that's the reason I drove down here. Please, for God's sakes, you have got to get that money to Overland Avenue immediately between 1945 Overland Avenue and 1959 Overland Avenue. You do not want to drive your Bentley down that street. If you have a Bentley, do not drive between 1945 and 1959 Overland Avenue. Keep your Bentleys away from there until the $43,609 in funds gets done to finally repave the street. Because the last thing we want is another problem with another Bentley claiming damages against the city for those terrible streets that are overrun with potholes and, and destruction. So this is good. Save a Bentley, $43,609. Also, they should get to the adjacent street which is between the, the 1300 block and over by 5,000 block of Havenhurst Avenue between the 101 and Ventura Boulevard, that adjacent street next to Overland Avenue should also be repaved immediately. It's right next to Overland Avenue. So if you could give another, another $100,000, I, I think that'll do the job. And our great building inspector, Mr. Gold, over in CD3, would also endorse this great Overland project. Thank you to Paul Coretz for that money. And please pass it forthwith so we can begin construction on Friday. OK, members, without objection, I'd uh, recommend that we advance the appointment of the uh, Dr. Sun Won Son uh, to the council without recommendation, as he is not here today. He was traveling. So um, I would recommend that we advance it without recommendation. And on item number eight, um, I recommend that we approve the motion and advance it to council. Is there any objection? Seeing none, that will be the action of the committee on item 6 and items 8. Uh, Mr. Kretz, I think you wanted to raise some issues on item number 7, so we're going to hold that matter na for now. Um, we're going to now recess the regular meeting and go to the special meeting uh, as it is now past 2.15 uh, for consideration of the FSR. Um, now, the way we're going to proceed with this, because we do have a number of closed session items that we are actually going to take up next, 
but the way we're going to proceed with this, as we usually do with the FSR, is to go through our departmental roll call uh, so that uh, members can call any uh, departments special that they wish to ask particular questions of. Um, and then once, once we've completed that, if your department hasn't been called, we thank you for your attendance, we thank you for coming down, um, and you'll be able to head back for work. So uh, who would like to start? I know Mr. Bonin wanted to call Department of Transportation. I want to speak to LAPD. Members, other departments, Mr. Blumenfield? Uh, fire, Housing, Personnel, Zoo. LAFD, Housing, Zoo. And what else? Uh, say personnel. Personnel. Mr. Chris? Um, I didn't go do a good job of taking notes, so I might miss some. Uh, animal services, finance, LAPD and DOT, Personnel, LAFD, and housing. Okay. Anything else? We got DOT. Anything else? We're good? Okay. Um, then with that, oh, Dion, did you need to speak to me? Um, so, we have Department of Transportation, LAPD, Fire, Housing, Zoo, Personnel, Animal Services, and Finance. Anything else, members? Going once, going twice. If I didn't mention your department, thank you all very much for coming down. See you next time. Now, while they're exiting, because they always do it in a very noisy fashion, um, while they're on their way out, uh, to the attorneys in the room, sorry, we're going to go ahead and take up the FSR now, and we'll come back to closed session when we're uh, done with that. So, sorry? No, 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 this um, was my call. All right, and we're now uh, also joined by Mr. Vonnen, so we're going to proceed with item number 10. So if we can call up the CAO. Item number 10 is the City Administrative Officer Report relative to the first financial status report for fiscal year 2015-2016. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Miguel Santana, CAO. I'll give some general comments, then turn it over to uh, Maria Gutierrez, who could walk you through the specifics of the FSR. Um, as you know, we submit a financial status report uh, almost on a quarterly basis, sometimes a little bit more than that to provide your council an opportunity to find, to learn as to where we are in relation to both expenditures and revenues. Um, there's, there's both good news and not so good news in this FSR. Um, the good news is that our reserve funds are higher than what we originally budgeted. They're at 8.18 .8 of the general fund, uh, which is $129 million more than the uh, adopted budget which assumed the reserve fund to be at 5.79% of the general fund. And we recently received our bond ratings for all four of the various uh, bond rating agencies that reaffirmed uh, the city's uh, ratings of AA minus, in part due to our strong reserve funds. Um, they also talk about the fact that uh, we have very strong management, uh, moderate debt and have had some success in dealing with certain liabilities, particularly uh, the Ardon case and, and the Willett case, as you are well aware. Uh, but they also uh, issued some cautionary notes. In fact, uh, SNP, we recently learned, uh, moved our outlook from positive to stable, which means that they um, normally when your outlook is positive, they're signaling that 
were due for an upgrade, when they bring it back to stable, it means that we shouldn't be too optimistic of that occurring. And specifically, they cite that while we've made significant progress on some of our liabilities, uh, we still have others that remain outstanding. Particularly, uh, particular concern is the litigation involving the transfer, which you're familiar with. Um, other con issues that we're monitoring carefully that we talk about in the FSR is we're wrapping up the final uh, analysis on the coalition deal that was recently ratified, will be coming before council hopefully next week. Um, we're hoping that your committee as well as uh, personnel committee will have a full um, public discussion about th that deal. Uh, we're anticipating and we articulate in the FSR about a $62 million shortfall that we're seeing based on certain patterns of expenditures. Um, we're all preparing for the impact of a Nino. We don't know uh, exactly how significant it would be, uh, but we know that there would be additional impacts to the city and possibly a financial um, impact as well. We're still anticipating a structural deficit. While we're on our way to eliminating it over the next two years, next year we have identified about a $90 million structural deficit. Other liabilities that have been raised are particularly the LAPD Overtime Bank, which today in aggregate is about $110 million. The good news is that because we've budgeted uh, what we're actually spending, that bank hasn't been growing. Uh, we've been actually paying out in cash. Um, and then, of course, uh, there, the current discussion around homelessness, uh, commitment to uh, identify $100 million uh, for homeless-related programs or something that uh, we talk about in the FSR is just to put this, the additional funds that aren't on budget in context. So overall, in this particular FSR, we're recommending an approach as we proceed forward for the rest of the year. Um, the first is that we take care of a handful of smaller items to, um, through the UB that was put aside, about $17 million that, you're, that you wisely put aside uh, for any, any issues that surface throughout the year, to take care of uh, things that we know we'll have to deal with, um, uh, additional costs for Medicare uh, due to the size of the workforce being slightly larger than what we anticipated. Um, the swapping of the clean streets because we anticipated it being funded out of special funds, but we recommend given the fact that we haven't reached conclusion on the legality of that, that we, we go ahead and do it with general fund. And then uh, the subvention agreement related to the Westfield Topanga, the total about 9.3. Um, the other issues that we're being mindful of are uh, potential deficits in both fire and police totaling uh, over $20 million. Uh, we are concerned that there are a number of liabilities, uh, claims in particular and settlements or judgments that are expected to reach conclusion sometime this fiscal year. Uh, we put in $20 million as a plug, but we actually anticipate to be significantly higher. We're working with the city attorney's office Hopefully by the next FSR we'll have a better sense of what that actually looks like. Um, so in terms of our approach, we recommend that for this FSR we only uh, take care of a few minor things that you direct departments with deficits to start identifying solutions um, and trying to manage them um, themselves and we'll continue to, to um, uh, report on that in subsequent FSRs. We are also recommending um, that we still maintain the practice of, of having as healthy of a reserve as possible uh, for a couple of reasons. The first is that in the past we've used a portion of the reserve to deal with the next year's deficit, and so we may have to do that again. The second is um, to really start building the commitment around homelessness, $100 million that, that um, your council has been discussing. And then uh, the third is to start um, managing the overtime bank. The overtime bank uh, doesn't grow unless um, it grows based on promotions and salary increases. Uh, PPL, we do have an agreement. They're expected to get a 4% increase uh, July 1st. And so um, by buying down that bank, then it, we help control that. Um, finally, we are recommending that we put aside uh, $15 million uh, is create the budget um, around 
a special account around homelessness has been discussed at the, in your counterpart committee on homelessness uh, and put in a down payment of, of the 100 million, 15 million, mainly coming from the UB as well as some from the reserve and then working with the homeless committee um, to establish how to best spend those funds. The mayor has made a request on a number of specific um, projects uh, consistent with the motions that have been recently introduced around the winter shelter program, particularly in light of El Nino, uh, but also expanding uh, vouchers uh, for both veterans and for the general homeless population as well and to invest in the coordinated entry system. So with that, um, I'll be happy to answer any questions or how might I'll walk you through the specifics. All right, so members, can we uh, start with general questions about the FSR, non-department specific questions for the CAO, and then we'll start bringing up the departments. Mr. Kretz. I have one question, which is, uh, why did we get this information so late? Because uh, our office got it, we got it on Friday, we didn't really have time to do a good analysis, and some community folks mentioned that to me as well. Did it have to be so last minute? Could we have gotten this a couple of days before so we actually had time to analyze it? Um, it's always a challenge. I mean, we work and coordinate all the information from all the departments. Uh, we try to structure it. It's very voluminous, as you well know. The first one is always the hardest one to get out. Uh, in the future, we'll work on trying to submit it in a much uh, more timely fashion. I should just tell everyone the the due date is a week before it really is. Yeah, we actually so. tell them it's several weeks before it actually is. And even then, with that, we still Just had it. gave up your secret to everybody yes. who's sitting and, behind and, you. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, even, and even with that, we still had to submit a, an addendum to the FSR that you should all have as well, uh, because we'd receive some uh, last minute items as well. And one very general question. So I understand the city incorrectly used uh, AB 1290 funds. How can we fix that? And if you're not the right person to ask, who is the right person to ask? Um, are you, excuse me, Maria Gutierrez with the CAO's office. Are you referencing the 590,000 technical correction related to AB 1290? I believe so. so yeah. My understanding is it was just a one-time issue. It was uh, discussions that took place uh, and were basically just uh, during budget development and we are now making it right. So my understanding is it was just a one-time situation. Okay. So I don't so believe this is an ongoing issue. we need to correct issue. for a long term. No. Okay, thank you. Mr. Blumenfield. Um, it's too bad about the S&P going to stable, and I don't know, is there, I mean, the transfer fee is one of those big issues that's out there. I don't know if there's anything we can do to mitigate that risk in a way that would impact the S&P. Is there, or is that just, that's a liability we've got to deal with until we've worked it out? Well, it's, uh, yeah, it was frustrating because you well know how much work it's been involved in dealing with these other liabilities, and, yeah. and it hasn't been cheap. The Arizona case alone is well over $90 million, and Willits is $1.4 billion. Um, it was a disappointment, but it just speaks to how sensitive our situation is. While our economy is strong, uh, we get significant acknowledgement for the strong management of the city, uh, the fact that we do these FSRs and are very transparent about it. There are certain things beyond our control. That's one of them. Uh, we try to emphasize to the bond rating agencies that we even if you, you know, while it is certainly an outstanding issue, if you put it in context, it's less than 5% of our general fund. So it's, it's um, you know, the litigation is going to take months, years mm -hmm. for it to finally resolve. Uh, the city certainly is in a position and has a, a demonstrated track record of being able to respond to these kinds of uh, uncertainties. Uh, but again, their, their, their sense was that it's significant enough where um, their optimism about uh, getting a potential op upgrade is, is no longer there. Uh, the good news is that they didn't change our rating itself, um, and, and we are stable, not negative. So. Um, and so from that standpoint, uh, but it, yeah, we were very disappointed. There's no appealing your rating. I mean, it, it, it is what it is. Uh, you should know that the other rating agencies are stable as well. So it's, rating agencies also don't like to be outliers, you know, and, you know, they, they like to sort of operate in, in under the same kind of framework. And, and so that's part of the reason is. 
Well, and, and it may we'll talk about this in a different context about the different solutions to to that problem, but it may it may push us toward charter reform or something else as a solution faster than we might have otherwise. So at least it, to me, it opens up other possibilities. Unrelated question to that you mentioned the structural deficit. We're at 90 million. Um, are we what? Well, what's our trajectory for getting eliminating that? Is it is it changed? Or are we on the same trajectory for the final elimination of the structural deficit? So we try not to change the forecast too often because revenues and expenditures, you know, vary every month, and so. Uh, we only really do the forecast twice a year. That's when the mayor's budget comes out and then when the final budget gets um, signed. Um, and so we will update the forecast, obviously, when the, the next budget gets released on April 20th. Um, there are a number of new factors that were not identified in the last forecast, the most significant obviously being uh, the coalition deal. They are, we, we do have a number of years of zero. We're looking at the impact of going from the pension tier that was um, uh, imposed to the one that we've since negotiated. Um, the, the greatest impact would be in the outer years. Then initially there will be some impact due to uh, transitioning people from tier two back to tier one. Um, but um, and other expenditures is really the biggest issue is frankly um, whatever litigation we have pending. Most of it is fortunately one time. And so it's, it's, it speaks to why it's important to have a strong uh, reserve uh, for that purpose. And as we move forward, I recommend that your committee spend maybe one hearing just talking about litigation and strategies around that and ways to try to contain it, finding out where some of the problems are. Um, by the time it gets, gets to litigation, it's sort of like too late. There's, there's, I think, strategies we could talk about to focus on dealing it with it well in advance of litigation occurring, just as a subject matter I would recommend talking about in the future. Um, on the revenue side, you know, things, the revenue is very strong. You know, the economy is strong. Uh, property tax are, is higher than what we anticipated. Um, just tax, general, generally speaking, we're seeing uh, an increase. We're still seeing a, a utility users tax not reaching the same level. Some of it may be due to the billing problem at the DWP. Um, but you know, we're we're on track, I think, to to reaching the objective of eliminating the structural deficit. You know, short of you know. Uh, a major impact in one of those areas that I just talked about. Um, in the context of the transfer litigation, um, just as a, as in, in reference to the forecasting, you know, because because we know the litigation is outstanding and it's hard to predict the outcome, we did assume that the that the um, that the transfer stays flat. In the future, obviously, the impact of any rate increases that your council may ultimately apply would change that, but we are assuming it to be flat. And so one of the things to be mindful is, in, as we get closer to the budget, is how to treat the transfer in the context of any future um, budgets in light of the uncertainty. And the rating agencies will obviously be paying attention to that, to that as well. April last year, we said it would be two years for the structural deficit, so we're... Yeah. Mr. Bonnet. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you uh, for the report. Uh, I had a couple questions on some of the, um, the revenue shortfalls. Uh, you mentioned on page five that um, there's a shortfall of almost five million in the <coughs> documentary transfer tax. And I was a little unclear on the, the sort of the sentences that, that, that followed that. I, 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 Perhaps what I'm seeing in my district is aberrational. I mean, the real estate market is like ridiculously insane in in, in my area. Uh, I, I seem to some indications here that you're saying that uh, could be a, uh, a an early sign of a downward trend. Um, wh what's your analysis of why the documentary transfer tax was down? Uh, Melissa Krantz, Office of the CAO. Uh, so the documentary transfer tax is comprised of two components. One is sales price and one is sales volume. So sales volume is increasing, so you do see that. Um, with regards to uh, the actual price, we kind of impute it. We don't use 
uh, like Case Shiller or anything like that. We calculate how much revenue we got, and we compare that to the deeds that, we were, that were transacted during that period. So it's back calculated. So what we find is that the revenue per deed, back calculating that, has dropped. And there's a chart on attachment 1H that shows you that. Mm -hmm. um, what we don't know, we were anticipating it kind of flattening out, um, but not to this level. Um, we do lag this, uh, the real estate market with regards to the documentary transfer tax. But at this time, it's really hard to tell whether it's just a mix. It could be that there's a lot of homes for sale and not that the prices are dropping. It's just that lower value homes are selling as well. But even if lower value homes were selling with the volume still high, why would that bring it down? Um, if, if you look at the chart, you can see there's actually been a drop in the, in the price. So it's, it's the price per deed. So the deeds, the transactions that are happening are for lower priced homes. Right. Whether that's a home that has actually declined in value, probably not likely. It could just be that you have more condos selling, you know, that sort of thing. Also, it's also a 12-month uh, rolling average. So, you know, that just means 12 months before you might have had a higher um, sales price and higher volume. And therefore, you know, when you start factoring it out and averaging it out, that shows up a decline. How far behind do we lag in terms of... I'm sorry, of, what did you say? How far behind do we lag in terms of our, uh, our collecting the money? You know, I believe it's between two and three months, but I'd have to get back to you for sure. Um, Mr. Santana, uh, I guess it was a couple years ago now, you had talked about... Uh, proposal to raise a documentary transfer tax. Is this at all a cause for us to revisit that? Well, in the in the context of the larger discussion on homelessness, you know, it's the the documentary transfer tax, like the sales tax, is the most vulnerable to the economy. So it's a it's a, a little bit of the canary in the mine in terms of how the economy is doing. But because of that, it's the most uh, variable. So it fluctuates significantly based on the economic swings. If, if your council is considering going back and pursuing an increase to the documentary transfer tax, the spending of this revenue source is probably best around um, one-time type of activity. So you have a base level of the tax, whatever, whenever it goes right. above that, you could spend it on, if there was an interest to start pursuing affordable housing, as an example, then it, you are allowed to help build a trust around that as opposed to funding, um, you know, public safety, which the cost is constant. So um, it's something that uh, I assume will be discussed in the context of your other committee on homelessness as a potential funding source. Okay. Um, it, in the report you had mentioned, um, while well, DOT was having had a surplus because of, and this isn't a DOT specific question, it's a general one. While they were, were doing better in salaries, uh, they had a, a surplus in salaries, that some of the revenue they had anticipated to collect was, was low, and that was because they hadn't hired people as quickly as had been anticipated. Is that a problem we're seeing throughout other revenue uh, generating departments, that, that the, the lag in hiring has, has caused us to collect less revenue? I think DOT is probably the largest. I don't know, Melissa, if you want to ask. Uh, yes, the um, parking fines, uh, that is a, not a departmental revenue. That is, you know, has its own revenue source, and that is uh, linked to um, hiring more full-time in lieu of part-time. Uh, the larger issue with other departmental receipts may be some vacancies, um, but we don't anticipate it being a large impact the way it is with parking fines. Uh, but those aren't, those are probably not monies we can recoup when we rehire. We're not suddenly going to go on a... A, a parking fine spree or something like that? that uh, well, part of the issue with parking fines, and probably DOT could better speak to it, is, um, you know, how they deploy their people and whether they're being, um, I know last year they identified an issue with um, uh, staffing being used for special events. So that's just people not doing parking enforcement at all. So, you know, when you gain back people doing parking enforcement, you would get some uh, growth there. But so generally speaking, the, the, the problems that we've talked about in this committee before about how long it takes from the council approving a position to the position being filled, problems with personnel, that's not generally creating a, a revenue generating problem? Not that I'm aware. Not that has been identified. I mean, in the, in the case in the DOT, it's, it's the, the kind of workforce that's being hired. So, so it, if you remember during the discussion of part-time versus full-time, the part-time traffic officers are focused exclusively yeah. on, on ticketing whereas full-time do a combination, so that may be part of what's impacting it as well. Okay. Um, you had mentioned 
uh, or, or you refer to uh, revenue assumptions based on collecting TOT from the short-term rental industry. Uh, and I know that there have been discussions with the short-term rental industry, but the, the council's policy on short-term rentals uh, hasn't moved as fast as the negotiations over them willing to pay the TOT. I've always felt that the regulations should dictate the revenue and not vice versa. So given that we haven't weighed in on what the regulation should be, which defines the universe of units that could be eligible for short-term rentals, uh, how do we know, how, how do you make an accurate prediction of what the revenue can be? If I may, um, if you look at attachment uh, 1i, uh, you can see what we've charted is just the growth that we should be reaching without accepting any, uh, expecting any Airbnb agreement. So, you know, even though our revenue budget is uh, 223 uh, million, our chart is 218 million, and that's based on trends in growth. So right now we're tracking uh, to reach that 218 million. We will not, that five million is not included in our trend analysis. So that, you know, we, we set that aside until council addresses what that policy will be. I'm not sure I quite understand. Let me, okay. let me, let me ask the question <laughs> sure. a, a, a different way. Um, among the short-term rental universe, there's different types. There's someone who's renting out their back room. That's one thing. Uh, a lot of people don't have a problem with that. Then there's a phenomenon I see a lot where someone buys an entire apartment building, everybody gets evicted, or and the whole thing becomes short-term rentals, and, which I'm hoping we outlaw uh, because it's having a huge impact on the rental market. Are we that they may be doing that now, and they may be paying the TOT because a lot of them are starting to pay the TOT, so they can show that they're good and they hope they won't get outlawed. Is, is that then going to be screwing up your revenue forecasts if we say you can't be running rogue hotels and taking? Uh, you know, the Office of Finance the um, is, at least at this point, has been unable to distinguish between, you know, who's a short-term rental versus who's, uh, a, you know, a hotel or something. Now they may be able to speak to, to whether that's different. I would suspect that the, um, the amount of people actually remitting TOT of, you know, for their short-term rentals is probably incremental, a small amount, and would probably not be a, a large significant impact, but that is just my speculation. And if, you, if you recall, Councilman, um, during the discussion of the budget, the, the, the number that was used to identify the enhanced revenue due to the short-term rental was wasn't really based on anything other than it was a plug number. So, right. so you know, it's it's not it's not like we could say that we will be shorter or, or greater because it was just a, a it was a more optimistic view of what the revenue would be and short-term uh, rentals would be one way of getting there. But obviously, as you stated, uh, um, the policy that ultimately your council adopts or, or in, in the discussions that the city attorney is having, well, once there's clarification on that, will provide us a better way of tracking and forecasting that revenue. Right now, it was just a plug number that, that um, we're tracking. And depending on how the TOT does in general, if it does greater than we anticipated, then we'll hit that number by luck. Um, but it will, it will, it will we can't really can link it directly to whether it was due to the, the short-term rental okay. program. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Bonin. Just to follow up on one of Mr. Bonin's questions and maybe broaden it a little bit, um, there's a number of departments that are projecting uh, significant year-end year -end surpluses in their salary accounts, and um, part of that may be attributable to um, the point that Mr. Bonner raised, delays in filling budgeted positions that has been a, a aggravation for us for a, a very long time. Um, part of it might also be uh, general managers trying to economize and be frugal in anticipation that there might be downturns in revenues and needs to make uh, year-end adjustments. Specifically, and they include planning, engineering, sanitation, street services, rec and parks, transportation as, as has been mentioned. Do we have any sense of, in, in those areas at least, what is that surplus attributable to? Is it more the delays in getting positions filled? Is it more the ordinary practice of trying to be conservative uh, this early in the fiscal year? 
try to give us a better sense of that. I, I, my guess would be that most of it has to do with the fact that it's, it takes time to hire. I mean, this is, this is um, the first year in several that we don't have managed hiring, so departments can't be using that as the excuse anymore as to why they can't hire. But having said that, the machine around hiring still takes time. And so generally speaking, and we've had this conversation many times, it takes about a year to hire from someone from beginning to end. And so while a number of departments have, um, when new positions were created, the budget generally assumes a, a nine month or possibly six month um, allocation. Um, there's still the regular positions that exist that assume that people will be hired on year one. Some of it may be on day one rather. Some of it also may be that we're having, experiencing higher attrition than normal. We're seeing more and more folks retiring. So positions are vacant. Uh, general managers may have not anticipated that that person or group of people would have retired and so they're having to go back and fill in positions that are being made vacant due to unanticipated retirements and you know someone who's eligible for retire isn't obligated to tell you well in advance that they're going to retire so that may be part of the issue as well but it's a as the city starts um, hiring again um, the the machine around hiring is oiling up and preparing itself. You know, I know personnel department, new positions were added to help assist through that process, but it's still gonna take, I would say, at least a year before the machine is well oiled to, to reduce the amount of time it takes to hire. Okay. Um, and I suspect we'll all have questions for personnel when they come up and um, maybe some of the individual departments that have been called as well. Um, so we've been doing really, really well with the reserve. And um, I continue to be really pleased that we have a strong reserve. Um, given the fact that concerns have been raised by some of the credit agencies about the potential for liability and the other issues that you described, um, can you speak to the effect of reducing the reserve, even if we keep it above the policy, uh, the current policy uh, number, but it's lower than what it is now. Um, do we have some flexibility in doing that? And if so, to what extent? I mean, just before it starts to have more adverse impact um, on our credit worthiness. So I think our ass assess the, the agency's assessment of our credit worthiness is, I guess, how I should put it. You know, I think the first thing that the, the bond rating agencies look at is what is your policy and are you meeting your own basic policy and for a long time as you remember we weren't so now we are then second is what have you committed to and and what we budgeted is a commitment that we've set are you meeting that commitment and, and uh, the good news in the FSR is that we're not only meeting what was budgeted what we're exceeding um, the third sort of line of questioning is, you know, in recognition that this is one-time money, let's say if the council wanted to spend the entire amount above what was budgeted, um, what are you spending it on? If, if the council would choose to spend it on ongoing programs, then it would sort of provide a red flag that you're using one-time money to make a long-term commitment. And, um, the, what the rating agencies would respond favorably to would be if you're using that reserve fund to deal with liabilities. So, the, you know, one of the reasons we recommend the overtime bank to start buying it down is because it's a liability we know they're concerned about, you've expressed concern about, we're actually now funding overtime to the appropriate level, which was the first hardest step. Now it's like buying, paying off your credit card, you know, starting to make a dent in doing that would be a prudent way that would, they would respond favorably. If, if the council were to, you know, we know, for example, with the Ardon case, you know, we put half of the money aside to deal with the, the, that litigation, but we don't know what the outcomes is gonna be. Right now people are actually submitting their, their applications to get reimbursed, and so if, Fortunately, it's capped, but if it reaches above that 50 million, we'll have to figure out a way to deal with that. You know, we have a number of options, but spending whatever is left over around right that would make sense. Uh, on homelessness, you know, homelessness is an issue that's not going to go away anytime soon, unfortunately. 
but the, the Committee Around Homelessness and your Council is exploring a number of different initiatives, a, a strategic plan, and it, it would be uh, prudent that as you think about a long-term funding source that you may want to put one-time money aside for purposes of of exploring different approaches or dealing with the immediate crisis. So, do you, you know, for example, the winter shelter program, that's obviously generated due to a one-time event of El Nino. Uh, so spending it on those kinds of things. So it's, it, you know, there's no like magic bullet here, but it's all about how we're spending the one-time money that we have. That's what's gonna be evaluated. Overall, because your committee and your council has been committed to building the reserve fund as a way of dealing with these liabilities, but also to provide you flexibility in the event of something happening, then it's been seen as a positive thing. And it's in fact giving you flexibility. Um, the, more, the most important flexibility is that we've had to rely on the reserve fund every year to deal with the deficit that we confront the following year. Mm -hmm. So that's always been part of the last few budgets. Um, and my guess would be that will probably be the same next year until the structural deficit is gone. So um, that's a, you know, I would, those are sort of the line of questioning that we get asked. Um, we're very transparent, as you know, and we get a lot of recognition and acknowledgement for the fact that we're straightforward about our liabilities figuring out how, having a plan around how we're dealing with them is important as well. Okay. Members, anything else for the CAO? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Don't go too far. I'll be right here. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, why don't we uh, start, members, with, uh, what would, I guess we can just go in, uh, Let's start with the fire department. So I think you called fire as well, uh, Mr. Kretz? Yes, so we'll start with the fire. <coughs> I had a few for fire as well. Okay, excellent. Good afternoon, and we'll start with Mr. Blumenfield on fire. Um, and fire, we've been discussing in TCT the sale of the Ontario Airport um, and the possibility of potentially transferring some of those safety officers that are duly trained as uh, police and fire. And it's, conceptually it sounds like a great idea because we're trying to get all these folks and here we have a, a pool of trained uh, officers that potentially could be brought in. Uh, the potential problem is that when we have authorized, what, 295 new recruits uh, at entry level salary levels. But if we take in these folks, which could be a good idea, that, that may change that dynamic. So um, has the department and the CAO talked about this? Is this something uh, that we have a plan of action for? Where, and is this something that we need help from the budget committee to help make happen? Because um, it, it may be something that we want to do, but we want to come back to the budget committee about. Hello. The department has had uh, discussions uh, with the um, Department of Airports about the possibility of 1014ing um, under Charter Section 1014 um, the individuals who are potentially going to be laid off as public safety officers. Obviously, one of the concerns that the department has uh, is the ability of these individuals to be able to complete a modified. Um, drill tower. Um, so what we are requesting of LAWA is that um, these public safety officers remain on the budget um, or on the payroll for LAWA until they complete uh, training. Um, because if we go ahead and accept them into the department, they would be 1014 into um, our ranks. And if they are unsuccessful completing the academy, then the burden will be on the fire department to find another position within uh, the department uh, to retain them. So that's a proposal that's been submitted to the department and we're awaiting a response from them. Councilman, if I could add, as you know, um, based on the conversation the last in your, the other committee, um, we're still a couple years away before that um, gets effectuated and, and uh, 
without going into too much detail, uh, because the matter is subject to litigation and settlement discussions, um, it is the city's position that no employee would be laid off. And obviously, as you pointed out, those that are duly trained, uh, it would make the most sense for them to be placed within the fire department, since that's an area that's uh, aggressively hiring. Um, we have a couple years to, to, to resolve that issue, um, but the city is committed to making sure that no city employee is laid off as a result of the transfer of the airport, should it occur. And it sounds like we're nothing in this discussion is going to going to take us off our goal in terms of the recruits that we want for the fire department. We're on track with with all of that, so that's great. Thank you, Mr. Bonnet. Uh Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> a few questions. Um, one, just a, a, a general question, and maybe this might be a question for for Miguel. I noted that um, the department's revenue budget for the fiscal year uh, is about 160 million uh, and it's projected to meet its revenue budget. I'm just wondering how does LAFD rank as a revenue generating department? Are they, would, are they one of the big revenue would, generators? Um, well, it, they provide uh, revenue certainly through the um, ambulance system, but the, the, certainly the department could be more specific as to how much revenue is generated. I think they would be the first to say that they don't produce enough revenue to cover the cost sure. of their own department. Um, are you asking rank in terms of um, citywide revenue sources? Yeah, I was just curious how it ranks compared to the other city departments. Uh, I think we'd have to point back to the revenue table in a chart. That, that's okay. You, you can get back to me. Okay, sure. To you. It was just a, a curiosity question. Uh, a, a more uh, uh, on-point question is uh, Mr. Koretz had a, a motion earlier in the year uh, to install no smoking signs in the very uh, high uh, fire zones. And uh, we had been told as that was going through the process that um, uh, it would cost about 79000 to install the signs. And the CAO had said at the time that the department had sufficient funding to do that. I just want to make sure that that's still the case. Uh, sure, Emilio Rodriguez, uh, Fire Department. Yes, we, we can um, cash flow the cost, um, you know, for this period. And, you know, we'll continue to monitor the budget and report back on the department's, um, you know, fiscal condition over the coming FSRs. So we've, we've got the money to install the site. Sure, yes. Okay. All right. So then I wanted to ask a question about the unused sick time. Uh, according to the FSR, it says this account is projected to have a deficit of $2.5 million due, due to an estimated 175 participants exiting the, the drop program. I'm confused about why that's sort of surprising to us, because the drop program gives us a lot of uh, predictability. So why didn't we have this factored in, at, in, in the budget in the first place? We, we knew these folks were going to be retiring at this time. It was uh, requested in the budget, and it was uh, not approved. Uh, not approved by us? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Our bad then. Um, uh, question on uh, general overtime. Uh, the FSR says that the deficit in the overtime general account is due to overtime accumulated by mechanics who are maintaining the department's aging fleet. We, we knew the fleet was aging. Uh, were we, uh, did, did we drop the ball on, on, on this as, as well? Was this something that was brought up that we were going to need to be doing this? This, this is a uh, continuing issue, as you know, uh, Councilman, uh, with the department's overtime account. Um, we expend about in excess of $1.2 million uh, within the overtime account, primarily attributable to overtime expended by the mechanics um, and what has been consistently budgeted within our, our uh, overtime Civilian overtime account is 1.2 million, but you know we we do exceed that. So, you know it's it's something that um, we are familiar with, and um, it's 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 one of the vagaries, I guess, you know, of uh, the city um, and its budget approval process. Um, there are a number of items that we had requested in the budget that uh, were not approved. Uh, most significantly, the four million dollars. Um, attributable to the um, constant staffing overtime of the dispatchers. 
Um, so, you know, there's a shortfall there as well. Um, but, you know, we certainly were grateful for the increase that we did receive in the budget, but not everything that we had asked for was approved. So I, I guess this is a, this might be a question for Miguel again. Um, if, if these are things that the department anticipated uh, as expenses that were going to happen that are driving their deficit now, and they, they anticipated them, but th through the, the, the process, the, the council, the mayor, the CAO didn't incorporate them, is that still something that can put them in managed hiring jail? Um, it, it's part of the reason why we didn't recommend for them to be a managed hiring jail right. this time around. Uh, we're flagging it as an issue and we know that uh, we're not necessarily surprised by some of the shortfalls that both police and fire are encountering. But part of the way we interpreted the council and the mayor adopting a budget that wasn't uh, at a hundred percent of what the department requested is that you're also asking the department to find a different way of funding it. And so um, so certainly all of us as general managers, when we're none, with maybe a handful of exceptions, none of us get 100% of our, what our budget requests are. The budgets are what they are. We're expected to live within those budgets, and so that means other things don't get done. And so um, ultimately, um, uh, your committee decides who goes to manage hiring jail. <laughs> uh, we, we recommend, and this time we're not recommending it, but we are signaling that uh, department is is falling short of what their budget is um, there's a number of reasons for that as you indicated um, and so some departments will come back and say because I'm short X amount that means I'm going to stop doing the following things right. and so that gives the department the opportunity to to report as to what those things are for your consideration and then you may decide at that point no these other things are too important so we're willing to make up the difference or share in part of that or you know that's really uh, start the conversation to problem solve in terms of how to finally get to a balanced budget All right. thank you thank you mr. chair <coughs> Chris. Well, that actually brings up a very general philosophical question, which is how many things do we turn down in the budget that, depart that a department actually has to do anyway? How often does that happen where they tell us that we need the money for this, we don't approve it, but then they have to do it? So It happens a lot. Every department would tell you it happens a lot, and it just, it's, been the, it's just been the nature of, but it's true for every level of government, I would say. I mean, it's, it's very rare that a department gets 100 percent. And, you know, even if you're 100 percent of, of what you ask, you could always be more efficient or do things uh, with a shorter period of time. But I think that's, you know, the, the, budget, requ the budget that the mayor submits is, does the first crack at eliminating things that the departments asked for that there simply wasn't enough funding to do and that's why departments come to you and present their additional asks and many do in fact and, and the two biggest one fire and police are, are every year have consistently asked for additional funding um, that because there are other priorities or you know and limited resources are un unable to and so we we try to flag those things that we know are likely to be impossible last year the biggest one was obviously overtime police overtime we knew when the budget was approved that police overtime was significantly underfunded and so uh, we recommended it right almost at the beginning of the fiscal year that we need to start preparing for funding and, and, and your council ended up doing that so so um, um, but it, it's a it's an issue across yeah, I just don't know how, if there's a way that we can get at that a little more so that we fund the things that absolutely need to be done. I mean, we can cut 911 funding, but ultimately we know we need to staff 911 well enough to answer everybody's calls. So certain things really aren't optional. And I don't know if there's a way to flag for us better before we approve a final budget, whether we've actually missed some things that no matter what are going to overrun the costs. In, in our budget letter, when the mayor submits uh, his budget, we always have a budget letter, and there are specific areas that my office has identified that we know for a fact are underfunded and will have to be contended with one way or the other. And um, 
the, some of the, the structural part of the, the fire department, for example, are issues that we flagged in the past as being, as being issues. Again, last year was overtime. Um, we could certainly, uh, working with the CLA, um, try to pull those out and during our presentation of the budget uh, be much more uh, descriptive as to those things that we are concerned about. Right. Liabilities is another one. That's just as a heads up, that's the next one that's going to be coming up in the next, F we flag it in this FSR, but liabilities were significantly, significantly funded below what we're going to ultimately pay out. Now, on another subject that covers LAPD as well, um, there's probably a couple of them. Um, I know we've read in various places that uh, we have a pretty high claims rate among our sworn officers that over 50% uh, will file a claim during, I think it was a three-year period. Um, are we doing anything to analyze that and look at how we can drive that down to what would seem like a, a more rational number that would correspond to real injuries that, that uh, weren't preventable? Um, yes, my office has been uh meeting with the city attorney directly about strategies to address the growing number of liabilities. This year, the ones that we are, are going to confront are, are, are mainly due with cases that are external to the city or of incidents that occurred several years ago or in some cases decades ago that we're, we're having to confront, unfortunately, this fiscal year. Uh, but specifically looking at strategies around cases that are resulting internally, so due to um, human resource related issues or discrimination related issues or sexual harassment, those kinds of things that, that certainly we could do a better job managing. Th th those are strategies that we're starting to talk to to figure out how do we uh, start controlling those costs. And uh, actually I mentioned 911, but I've actually gotten a few complaints from constituents that their 911 calls are not being answered promptly. Do we know if we're having, whether that's just an anecdotal coincidence or are we actually having problems with the 911 uh, calls being answered promptly and, and adequate staffing? The uh, initial 911 calls are received by the police department and it's the police dispatchers that make a determination as to whether the call needs to be referred to the fire department. So I'm not sure whether the complaints that you're receiving are based on the initial 911 call or whether it's as a result of the referral from or the transfer from uh, the LAPD to the fire department. Uh, it's my understanding that the fire department has not had difficulties in promptly responding to uh, the calls that have been transferred to our dispatchers. So you're not aware of any problems at the fire level on that? No, not at all, sir. And one last question. Um, I know when we were talking about trying to train as many firefighters as possible and, and speed up hiring, um, we had some conversation about being able to uh, add a training site that would um, only train paramedics and then cross-train them later, later to get more of a jump on, on hiring. Um, is that still being looked at? Is that moving forward? Do we know where, where that stands? There actually is a report that has been um, transmitted uh, to the City Council. I think that it's pending consideration by the Public Safety Committee and certainly it will be referred to your committee as well. Um, what we had um, indicated to the CAO um, is that having a paramedic only class um, really is not feasible. Um, first of all, it would take uh, the personnel department a tremendous amount of time to determine those candidates that well, would, I'm sorry, <coughs> to determine which candidates have a paramedic uh, license. And um, if it is the city council's desire to have a sixth class, what we're recommending is that we move forward in the same uh, method of candidate processing as we have been uh, over the last several years. And in fact, um, because of the scheduling of the classes for the current fiscal year, there is a window of opportunity for us to have uh, a sixth class beginning in February. And what's significant about that particular time frame is, number one, it um, avoids the need to have to, to open up, up a third site. Um, in addition, um, because of the significant um, increase in the number of individuals who will be dropping uh, in June, there will be 65 that will be dropping in June. If we do have the sixth class, um, and if we have as many as 50 recruits within that class, we can conceivably um, 
graduate 40 recruits in order to fill those 65 vacancies that we're anticipating in June. Uh, so that issue is coming forward you know, to your committee. Is there anything that we can do here from a fiscal point of view to make that easier? Well, I don't know whether or not it's going to be easy. It's going to cost an additional $3.1 million um, in order to affect that class. Um, and certainly that's a concern that the CAO has uh, with respect uh, to the competing um, funding issues that the City Council is going to have to be considering. I'm just wondering, is that anything that we could take up here now, or should we wait for that process step by step to, to come to us? I would recommend waiting since the Public Safety Committee is, uh, the report was first uh, sent to that committee, and then it will come to your committee after that. Okay. Okay, thank you. Anything else for fire members? All right, thank you all very much. Um, let's bring up DOT next. Mr. Bonnet. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, first of all, congratulations. You're doing good so far. You guys are running a surplus in salaries. Yes, thank you. Um, if you had been able to hire more quickly, how would you be doing on salaries? Have you run those numbers? Okay. Selwyn Holland's Department of Transportation. Um, in our situation, we're kind of unique in that many of our employees um, spend their entire career in our department. And so part of the reason for some of the delayed hiring has to do with promotions. So if someone promotes, then we have the vacancy, we have to backfill that. Um, but if we were, like Miguel Santana um, said, I think in a few months we should be in good rhythm and um, a lot of this gap in hiring will be, be gone. Um, part of the, you know, to project, we, we were just so excited just to be able to fill positions. We didn't even look at assessing any savings. We just are trying to hire as fast as we can. Logistically, there's only so much you can do. So many rooms, so many interview panels, et cetera. So. Right. All right. So, so let me ask about a, a couple specific things. Um, you've been hiring, but you still have fewer crossing guards than we had when we started. Um, and I understand that's because a lot of folks are retiring. It's not the easiest job in the world to fill. So what are we going to do about it? Well, actually, we're acti actively hiring, and I'll turn it over to Greg. Yeah, good afternoon. Brian Hill, Deputy Chief. Uh, we are currently have an ongoing process in terms of the hiring and interviewing crossing guards for the various areas uh, throughout the city. Um, as you mentioned a moment ago, there is a pretty high attrition rate because of the age of our crossing guard population. Um, the fact that uh, the hours and what they work in terms of a three-hour shift, which is a split shift, that has yielded uh, as well some additional attrition. And so one of the things we're looking at is to expand the pool of potential applicants to uh, look at uh, our college campuses as something we hadn't done, uh, expanding our notices to senior center centers as well. Uh, to create a broader cross-section and, and more applicants to the process. Going through the background process is, is another stumbling block in terms of the DOJ background check that's necessary, as well as the uh, medical certification that they are uh, fit and capable to perform the task of a crossing guard. Is the problem with the DOJ and the medical that the process takes too long, or is it that it disqualifies people who should be disqualified? They are, many are disqualified from serving. Okay, so that's a, it's a good thing. Yes. All right. So we were supposed to have increased by 65 the number of crossing guards, and we're actually, at least according to the FSR, maybe you have more current numbers, we're down 15. Um, when do we think, given the patterns that you're seeing, when, when do we think we'll be able to go up, and do you, is there a realistic chance that we're going to get to the 475 this year? I don't foresee us reaching that goal this year because of the ongoing attrition as well as the current um, pool of candidates. One of the things that we recently have done is to reach out to our HR staff in-house to 
help expedite that process uh, for those applicants, having some of our parking enforcement staff assist them with making the calls, handling some of the paperwork, whatever the case may be, but just to help to expedite that process. Uh, a year or two ago, I don't remember the details, I'm a little fuzzy on it, but uh, uh, there was something that the crossing guards used to get. It was sort of like a, a bonus hours pay or something like that that got taken away. How much of an impact has that had on the ability to fill these positions? It hasn't really had an effect on the ability to fill the positions, but it increased the number of retirees. They don't get that bonus in the, for staying. For There was a bonus where they get there for the morning and the afternoon, they get a little extra. Uh, that ensured they showed up the second time. So those that were getting that and still working the same number of hours decided to step away. So, so they basically got a pay cut. Right. Uh, it, it, but it sounds like from the way you answered that question that reinstating it, if that were something we tried to do, probably wouldn't be a huge incentive in hiring? Well, it would basically be a, a higher salary for them because right. then they would get that, so that would help too. But it, the, the ones that are coming in now don't know that they had that, so right. it doesn't really affect them. But if we were to return to that, uh, we would be able to retain more, I believe, and I believe we'd attract more right. as well. Uh, Mr. CAO, I think that's a discussion we might need to have if we're, if, if we're actually at fewer than we had before, given the, the critical public safety need of this. Um, during the budget discussions, we had some back and forth about the potential of, and we've had it in T committee as well, of DOT working to train volunteers at schools. I know there's some legal issues with that and, and all, but where, where are we on that? I mean, there... If, if we can't hire folks, I mean, the, the need is still great. Is there a way we can do something that's more of a public-private partnership? Yeah, currently, the ordinance allows for volunteers to be trained and, and authorized by the police department. They can authorize. Um, they had a couple of uh, STOs, or excuse me, um, uh, there are yeah, STOs that were doing that in certain areas, certain stations, uh, and they had a very small program. That officer that was leading that retired, and the program disappeared at that time. So it would be something that we'd have to partner with LAPD to reinstate that program. Other than that, it would require an ordinance change to allow others than police, fire, and DOT to direct traffic in the roadway. Right, I'd like some follow-up on that, because we've talked about it in, in both committees, and it looks like we haven't moved anywhere on it, and I think given these numbers, it's something that we're going to have to look seriously at. Uh, the uh, traffic control offers officers generally. Uh, one of the reasons we, we saw uh, some of the decline in, in revenue for parking is that we've started moving folks, uh, moving from part-time to full-time. Um, that's sort of one of the, the negatives of that transition, but what are some of the positives that we've seen of the transition? But the positives that we're seeing is they get a look at us and we get a look at them. The, the job is tough, as you know, uh, parking enforcement. They take a lot of uh, grief from the, from the public. Uh, it gets them an opportunity to understand whether they can have the, the, the wherewithal to do that job. Uh, and then we also, before they transition, are able to evaluate their error rate, their, uh, their attendance rate, their ability to do the job. And so it's an it's a opportunity for us to preview an employee before we make them full time. By, by how many um, uh, man hours or, or person hours have we been able to increase uh, deployment of um, TCOs at uh, intersections? I don't have those numbers with me today. Um, as you heard before, that we have we, it's steadily increasing our request for traffic control services citywide, and that's the, that's part of the equation that Mr. Kretz asked about on the on the revenue. They are directing traffic. They don't do enforcement. And the, the byproduct of enforcement is revenue. Okay. Um, so it's I'd have to check. I don't think there's a direct correlation because they transition out of part time into full time, and then we immediately backfill. The part-time um, is, is the plan, is how we try to do it. So, but we, we're, as a result, we have more full-time, right, than we did before? We've been authorized up to 585 uh, through the last two budgets. You raised it, and we are trying to get there. We're at 550, I think, 557, somewhere in that area. We, have a, we are hiring 17 to 18 in the next two weeks. So um, the part-timers can't do traffic control? Currently, they cannot. The, the full-timers can so by hiring more full-timers, have we made it easier to deal with um, uh, 
special events that are unanticipated or the FSR mentions due to El Nino there may be uh, emergency deployment of officers. Will that help us reduce what would have been higher costs because we have more folks who are able to, to do that? It will reduce our costs on on-duty, what we call un, un, uh, unusual occurrences. Special events is regulated by MOU to be paid at an overtime rate, but the more traffic officers we have for emergency response to an El Nino or a collision or a fire or a mudslide, that would be handled by on-duty staff and it would be less. Okay. Um, two final questions. I noted that um, there's a small transfer of money to help out the Great Streets program on Reseda. Uh, what about all the other Great Streets programs? Angela Berman, LADOT. Um, this is the Great Streets funding um, is for two locations, but this $25,000 would cover um, not just those two locations, but whatever's left over would go toward the next Great Streets that the mayor's office is working on. Okay, well, it probably won't go very far. It's only $25,000. Uh, but those were the only Great Streets that, that needed the funding? Currently, yes. There's also um, in the addendum another $120,000 that's being transferred as well. Oh, okay. The addendum came at one today, so I haven't had a chance to look at the addendum. Um, final question is on the, the bike and ped program. I see you're transferring some money from Measure R to salaries to work on, on bike and ped. Talk to me a little bit about what exactly that, that money is, is going to be for. I know we've been short on staffing because of pregnancies and people leaving jobs and stuff like that and it's hobbled some of our progress on projects and programs so what are we going to gain from this transfer you're referring to the three hundred thousand dollars yes yeah um, part of the bike impaired programs involves implementation yes. so a lot of the um, overtime work to support that it goes beyond just the engineering side of the house it gets down to the crews that are going to be out there putting the putting the ideas onto the road. So we want to ensure that we're able to do that effectively and quickly without any types of head, um, hiccups. The other staffing that normally does this is so um, overwhelmed with the routine maintenance and um, street resurfacing, et cetera, that we want to ensure that this doesn't get put on the shelf um, waiting around for the, for the time for them to do it. So um, we're trying to move the money just to keep the program. And, and what about the folks in the, the bike and ped unit them themselves. I understand there have been some staffing shortages there. What, what's being done to, to fill that? Well, there, as far as filling positions, yeah. Um, well, all of that's in, in play. It, it is part of our whole hiring effort. Okay. Our department probably had like 200 vacancies, so it's in the queue um, for the hiring process. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Fritz, anything for DOT? Um, <coughs> I think most of the questions I had planned to ask were were uh, already asked, but uh, I would ask how how we're doing in terms of revenue from uh, to to piggyback on Mr. Bonin's question from new full time officers in terms of how much of an opportunity they're having to do actual parking enforcement. You know, how much how much of those new officers' time is being pulled into other other needs, and how much is focused on traffic enforce on uh, parking enforcement. And I'm also wondering whether we could create a full-time category that was similar to what the part-timers are doing, where they could only do traffic parking enforcement, so we actually could get to all our parking enforcement needs, and presumably uh, all that would be self-funded since they raise more than their salaries. I'll let Greg talk on the revenue, but on the staffing side, um, the part-timers are hired as traffic officer one which is different than the full-time traffic officers. Full-time traffic officers are traffic officer twos. So there's a distinction in job classification. Um, they remain, the part-timers remain a one throughout their entire uh, service time as part-timers. When they promote to the full-time, that's when eventually after probation they become twos. Um, to have a, a job class that you're describing where they strictly do parking and it wouldn't be the full range of duties that would be at a parking uh, traffic officer one level um, so it's just a matter of part-timers versus full-timers at a one level um, there there is a, a, a compromise if you hire more traffic officers to only do parking enforcement you're limiting the ability of them 
to then do traffic control, which a lot of the full timers are called to do throughout the day. So that would be a major trade off to just focus on parking enforcement versus having the flexibility of doing parking enforcement and traffic control. And I'm, I'm viewing that as <clears throat> a potential positive that they couldn't do other things. Um, I can tell you, for instance, just a real life situation. I happen to live on a block and in a neighborhood that's constantly over parked and has huge violations. And when the weekend comes, we actually get parking enforcement and it's pretty universally applauded in my neighborhood. During the week, people can get away with violations much more easily because we don't have the same resources. Um, we could put in those extra resources, handle the job better, and we'd probably uh, at least break even, if not have a, a net gain in revenue at the same time. So that's my question, whether we could create that kind of a force and uh, keep people at some at, at a, a officer one rather than a two, um, presumably they'd get some benefits by becoming full time. But other than that, just leave them as, as a one if they were willing to do that or give people the choice. Um, I don't know if we've taken a look at that at all. Yes, we have looked at that and completely understand where you're going with it. In fact, as part of the, um, it's not signed yet, but part of the global agreement and the MOUs that are going to be coming out, that we are to revisit not only that issue, but the TO3, which is a traffic officer that does more than a TO2. Uh, and that would present the opportunity to, to present that structure in what you're talking about to have a, a TO1 level, because that's what we can do with people that can't direct traffic because they may have physical restrictions. Maybe they should be TO1s versus uh, being paid and not being able to do the job. So we're going to be well, looking at all of that. Maybe create an in-between. That would be like a, a 1B, obviously. You wouldn't call right. it that, but you get the idea. And the good news on the revenue is that um, I'm the optimist, so I'll tell you that we're at 95% of revenue, projected revenue, but uh, I believe the majority of the, uh, the, the reduction is due to the fact that we are n the revenue was assumed based on full staffing both 100 part-time and 585 full-time. It's a mathematical calculation. How many tickets on average do they write an hour? That's how we came up with the numbers uh, based on also that and their uh, the relaxed enforcement issues that we're having with street services. Um, so we're pretty close to our revenue goal, but we are running a little behind. Mr. Boone, just uh, one quick thing. I, most of the questions have been asked and answered. Uh, the, you, in the report, you highlight the um, El Nino, that we may have future requests coming up, and I'm sure we will, and it's one of those uh, surprises that's inevitable. Um, so my question is, is, is there something more that we should be doing, you know, budget-wise to, you know, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure that we should be doing now that's, that's not reflected in there? Or is there any, anything that you need from us to help? get you as prepared and ready for El Nino as possible because it's inevitable. Well, as a department, we've already done a lot on our own to prepare um, as far as buying materials, equipment, really ramping up. We've been doing a lot of exercises internally. We have a laundry list of things that we are going to do to prepare. Um, the reason why this is kind of highlighted is because it could become an overtime challenge. Um, the last time we had an El Nino between the mudslides, the flooding, road closures, et cetera, it, did, it was pretty taxing. This one, as you've heard a lot of the news reports, is saying it's probably going to be one of the, the, the biggest of, of, in a long time. So we, we just want to make that aware that that could become an issue as we move forward. Our intent is to try to, to manage our overtime costs, but should it arise, we, we just want to make everyone aware that it could be a situation where we may need additional funding support. And you're thinking the, the funding is really just coming in the, in the form of overtime. There's not other equipment or things like that that we should be looking at? Not at this time. We're okay. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. That's it. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's go ahead and bring up uh, personnel next. Mr. Kretz. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I know a number of departments were authorized to fill positions uh, for which the civil service list had expired and extra funds were provided to speed up the process. It seems like a number of departments are already behind in terms of staffing up, and in some cases that's costing them revenue. So is there anything additional that personnel could do to speed this up? Anything additional that we could do to be helping you? Well, um, as a result of the uh, resources that we received last year, I believe we received 12 positions. All of the positions have been filled and um, are uh, working on exams at, at the current time. We also have uh, approximately 10 exams that were contracted out. So we are using all the resources that we had. Um, in about June, the backlog as far as exams was concerned was about 130. We're down to about 75. So we are cranking through the exam process. What I think you're hearing is that um, the good news is, is that the personnel department is establishing um, a great deal of eligible lists um, completing the exam process. What I think is the challenge right now um, is the departments um, using those eligible lists, doing the logistical um, things around doing interview panels and actually filling those jobs. Um, so, I, and we've heard that quite a bit, is just the challenge of filling the jobs um, after the exam process is completed. Um, and the other thing is, is that there are many, many promotional exams um, that have finally been given in s several years. So, although you may be filling, let's say, a senior electrical mechanic or a senior electrical uh, inspector or so forth, um, the higher levels are also getting filled, and so you may end up um, having to refill and refill again because of the attrition that's going on. There's a tremendous amount of hiring going on throughout the city. Some of the de departments, and I think one of the departments mentioned it, have opted to fill the higher level positions bef before hit, uh, filling the lower level positions. So they're taking care of the managerial positions and promoting their staff up wherever possible. Um, but for the most part, what I, what I have even experienced myself is I may have four or five vacancies and um, I'll be able to fill three because even within the time of selecting somebody, sometimes um, employees find other opportunities and so although you're expecting that new employee to come to you, they may go to another department. So there is a considerable amount of hiring going on right now and as a result it has been challenging for the departments to fill all of their vacancies. But as far as the examining piece of the personnel department, I think we're doing um, a, a, a lot better than uh, late last year and we've been really using the resources that you provided, so thank you very much. So some of the problem is our own internal promotions which we obviously can't help. If if there's if it's, if someone promotes, then they leave a spot right. behind, and then we have to fill that. Right. So. It's it's logistics. Um, uh, all of again, the departments are hiring, and then again, uh, we're we're beginning to see the retirements happening as well. So um, one of the things that we do, uh, the exam analysts, um, throughout the exam process, we um, contact the departments throughout the exam process to check on the vacancies because what we found is when we started the exam process or when they originally requested the exam, they may have a certain number of vacancies, but it changes over time and we saw, we've seen it increase considerably. So routinely we're checking in because things are moving so quickly in the city. And you said also that the, the personnel piece may be done, but the departments uh, you know, still are behind. Are there ways that you can see that we can help deal with that issue? either that personnel can help or that we as a council can direct something to be done to help? Well, I know in the 23 departments that have been consolidated with uh, personnel department, um, the resources in the departments to do the selection process um, had uh, uh, decreased. Um, there was some cuts. And so we don't have um, enough staff out there to in, in the various departments to do the selection processes. So that's been an issue and um, I believe that uh, we will be requesting additional resources for the departments that are doing the selection processes. 
And when will you be requesting those in, in the FSR process in the future or just the next budgetary year? I believe both. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Bonner? I think Mr. Bloomfield had um, a few questions, so hang tight and we'll come back. He's good? Okay, great. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you very Thank much. You. <laughs> Uh, let's go ahead and bring up uh, finance next. I think all you call finance. Uh, could be. Good afternoon, Saul Romo with the Office of Finance. Ready to entertain any questions? Thank you. Mr. Kretz? Um, I, just, I have a question about uh, the administrative citation program. How are we doing on that? Financially, how's that playing out? Because I know it's it's still sort of at the pilot stage. Well, I think, and and really, this is a tag team question between finance and the office of the city attorney, because the office office of the city attorney is really administering the program. We are administering the financial element, that is, recording the receipts, making um, the expenditures, tracking the revenue. But from our perspective. There was some delay in getting the program initiated um, for all the right reasons. Um, and now we, we have two departments that are actively involved in the, in the program. Now that's LAPD and the Department of Animal Services. Um, the revenue is coming in. We get revenue on a monthly basis from the vendor who is, admit, who is working with the Office of the City Attorney on the um, collection of, of the citation um, receivables. We currently have about 146000 in revenue that's collected. Um, and th from that revenue, we pay any of the expenditures. Um, and so I think the foundation for the, for the program has been set. I, there are probably still a few issues to iron out, but the program is now moving forward. Any sense of how the animal services piece is performing so far? Animal services got delayed, obviously, because of the fire at Figaro Plaza. It certainly set back their operations, and so their time schedule for getting implemented was delayed um, as a result of that. But I know now we are starting to recover some receivables as a result of their particular program participation. I think by the next FSR, our department will be recommending the appropriate transfers from the trust fund that receives the money to the general fund, and we'll have a better sense of what the revenue projections are for the year, and as well as what the month-to-month -month, um, averages are, and get a better sense of if there are any other impediments to them fully participating in the program. So when will you have a sense of what a perfectly normal program would, would look like? Uh, as opposed to dealing with the fire and all the other things that slowed it down? I would say by the, 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 by the FSR, the next FSR in the mid-year, we'll have a better opportunity to report back to you on that in our respective departmental reports, if you'd like. Um, because, again, this is a coordinated effort between us and the city attorney's office, and I know with LAPD, they had a, there's the initial startup of printing the, the citation booklets, getting the internal structure, getting the internal parameters for administering the program, and now that we've got some good models out of LAPD and out of the animal services, I think that we'll be able to um, have a much more fluid process for the remaining ha second half of this fiscal year. Okay. Thank you. Actually, could I ask? Um, uh, just a point, based on the constituent complaints and issues that I've had uh, brought to me, um, I don't know that, and I'm not sure who to direct this to, uh, maybe the CAO. Uh, uh, Public Works, I don't think, is, is high on the list of the next few departments to, uh, to pick up ACE, but I think that's, that's where we're getting a lot of requests. So uh, I don't know what would have to happen to move public works up the, up the ladder, but I'd just like to ask that we give that some consideration. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kretz, why don't we keep rolling with animal services? Which you sure. Called, so. Go right ahead, Mr. Kretz. Okay. Uh, well, the Council on Animal Services took somewhat extraordinary steps to try and reprogram salary savings from the last fiscal year to facilitate technology upgrades. Yet uh, I think the FSR reported that the money 
ended up being swept into the general fund and has to be reappropriated if, and, and that may have happened for some other departments too, but particularly in this case, how'd that happen and why and how do we get past that? It's uh, my understanding that these funds were approved um, very late in the fiscal year. So you are correct. This tends to happen to a lot of departments. Um, so we'll, we review every request for reappropriation uh, and we scrutinize it because of the impact on the reserve fund. In some cases, it becomes too early in the fiscal year to determine if those funds will indeed be needed in the new fiscal year. In the case of this uh, chameleon project, it's my understanding that um, that was just a portion of the funding and the project may actually cost uh, a bit more and there was a report back that was pending. And I believe the strategy has been that we're going to wait for that report back and then address the issue in subsequent FSRs, the issue of uh, additional funding needs. John Forland with the Department of Animal Services. And uh, Saul uh, Romo, the Office of Finance is correct. I am dressed this way because we're moving into Fig Plaza today. And this is our fourth move, and, yes, <laughs> uh, and hopefully our last one in the, the last 10 months. And I got it caught a little off guard. I didn't uh, find out about the meeting until this morning. So this is, this is, this is why. It's fine. Um, as the uh, IT projects worked out, uh, we, we were fortunate in our timing. A comment by Councilmember Blumenfield as, uh, asking us uh, last spring to check out the technology that was going to be available. And HLP, the company for Chameleon, was just finning, finishing a pilot uh, for smartphones where we would be able to access, our officers would be able to access Chameleon from the field. And we decided in July that, that their, their, their own pilot, HLP's own pilot, had just concluded that we would phase it in and do a, a pilot ourselves and start with one shelter, uh, buy the phones for that, connect it up, and let our officers use it, and, and, and there's a recommendation of the CAO, and then just go uh, uh, shelter by shelter, or district by district, and phase it in. And it's worked out very well. It's just a little bit, uh, taking a little bit more time um, than we had thought last summer, but it's, it's with a good reason. There, there are also two other parts. There are three parts to that, and we're moving forward on all three of them. One was to build a, a data bridge, electronic bridge, from our online licensing uh, portal to link that information directly into Chameleon so our clerks wouldn't have to double entry, enter all of that information. The third one is the lockbox uh, with the Office of Finance, Finance Wells. All of our renewals for uh, animal licenses go into the lockbox, uh, mail in there, and then we right now, enter all of that information again a uh, second time, and, and Chameleon and HLP are going to help us build that link. Those last two, once we have that in, is going to save us about two million keystrokes a year. So we're very much looking forward to that. As it uh, turned out, HLP had done this many times in other areas with the online licensing, but they had not worked with Wells Fargo before. So it's maybe it's a good thing. We're very deliberate in what we're doing. We found out that some um, extra code writing is going to be required. Wells Fargo has a, a, a high security level for us to get access to their data. So we're moving on schedule. We had talked with the CAO about this before and just felt that it would, we wouldn't have anything for the first FSR. We are incurring expenses, and we are moving forward on th all three of those but that it would be best suited for the next report when we would have a better idea of what our upfront costs would be and what the, what the cost would be, full cost for the, for the, the entire city to implement the, uh, um, the field applications. So, so in other words, you don't feel like you're wildly behind. This is pretty much no. on track with where you thought you'd be. That's right. An extra couple of months we think is going to be really useful for us and we'll be able to nail down our costs and uh, come back with a reappropriation request. I think this will be a very valuable thing for efficiency and, and probably in a dozen different ways once we have it up and running. We, we really like what's happening. We're working out the bugs now, but um, 
I happened to have a half a day off Friday when we moved out of Two Count Plaza, and I did a ride along with one of the officers. It still takes a lot of time in the streets, a lot of times to, time to get from one call to the next. And anything we can do in the field to access the records for an animal or an address or an owner or input the records will save us driving time and in some cases allow us to return an animal without having to impound them. So we, we like what we're seeing so far. Very good. Anything else, members, for animal services? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go ahead and bring up uh, zoo department next. As the zoo comes up, in response to your question, Mr. Bonin, uh, the fire department um, produces about 160 million in revenue, about 18 percent of, uh, of the revenues. Cool. Thank you. Good afternoon. Lewis, welcome. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Blumenfield. Hello. Hi. Hi. I uh, just wanted to clarify one uh, question. The, there's the one point, uh, the one million plus from nighttime events at the zoo. Is that money going to the zoo uh, or to the Glaza Marketing Fund? John Lewis, the uh, general manager of the zoo. Uh, it's going into the zoo budget. But at the end of the year, um, all of our revenues will be part of what refund goes to Glaza. But it's after they, they have to hit a minimum revenue target that all of which comes to the zoo. And then anything over that revenue target, as, as it's listed in the budget, would uh, go to Glaza up to a finite amount. And then if there's even additional revenues, that comes back to the zoo. So with the, the, the shortfall, the $992,000 shortfall, you're saying before that goes into the Glaza Marketing Fund, that shortfall needs to be overcome? Yeah. That, go ahead. I just want, Janelle Irving with the Office of the CAO, want to make a small correction. Um, the 992,000 um, shortfall is actually a projected year end. So it is year end. And the, the nighttime recognition of the nighttime ticketed events is actually effectuating the council action that was taken subsequent to the formulation of the proposed budget. And and so this is kind of recognizing that revenue, but you are correct that that would, the, uh, the deficit for admissions would first be offset by this nighttime ticketed event revenue, and it'll be fully offset, um, offset that prior to any marketing refund. So if, that, if we're short that money, that actually comes out of Glaza's refund, not out of the zoo budget. Great. Thank you. Okay. Anything else for zoo? Thank right. you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Janelle. Uh, let's go next to housing. Mr. Blumenfield. Oops. Come up. <coughs> Welcome. Thank you. So, my question has to do with the, the, the Family Source Center RFP is out. Um, I'm very concerned that funding hasn't been identified for the Canoga Park, which is sort of the last, last one in line. And I'm worried about that. So I want to ask how the department and CO are working to address this. And uh, if CDBG funds aren't identified, what other funding sources are available? Uh, and, you know, particularly in relation to item nine, which we'll talk about later, where there's some, there is some funding. Uh, is that a potential? you know, use of funds and, and, but the base point is my strong concern about uh, the Canoga Park Resource Center, the only one uh, west of the 405 in the entire city. Um, Angelica Samayoa with the Housing and Community Investment Department. I may not be the best person to speak on this topic. We do have a monitoring and technical assistance division that has been um, in implementing this um, request for proposals process. I do understand that the overall intent has been to maintain that annual funding level per age, per um, family source center. It's definitely something that I can communicate back to our department, understanding your concern about this. I do know that the department has been actively looking for options to maintain the service level and um, that information can be, I, I'm, I'm just not able to provide any additional information on that. Uh, on that funding issue. Okay, well, we can, we can 
follow up on that in the future. Yes, it's just definitely. something I'm, I'm very concerned about in terms of identifying the fund. I know we keep talking around it that we're looking for the funds, but I guess until I hear that the funding is fully in place and that that, that family source center is not going to get cut out, I'm, I'm not going to rest easy. So thank okay. you. So can you please ensure that by the time the FSR is heard in council on Wednesday that Mr. Bloomfield gets that response? Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Members? Uh, yeah, also curious about, there is one other family source center west of the 405, it's just south of Mulholland. I meant uh, in the valley. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the one in CD11, if you could also report on, because I think our two have been the ones in jeopardy. Uh, separate question. I, I, I think this is for, for housing, it might not be. I noticed in the uh, FSR there was a, a note about the reduction in um, federal home grant funding. Is that administered by uh, HCID or is that? It um, is. It is. It is. Yes. Um, what is the impact of that going to be? I, I had heard from the domestic uh, violence uh, task force here in the city that it uh, was going to lead to a reduction in uh, 200 shelter beds for uh, victims of domestic violence. And I'm wondering what other impacts there would be as a result of these cuts. Um, I think there are actually other, there is another, uh, under the special, uh, under the regular agenda, I'm sorry, there's a reprogramming report. So there should be other colleagues here who are more expert at the topic. However, the relation, the domestic violence shelters are funded through the Community Development Block Grant. So they would not be impacted by the home cut. The home <coughs> cut is expected to be approximately 90, 93%. Uh, the current entitlement to the city is 87.7 million. So we're looking at a $17 million cut. That would directly affect our department's housing development bureau. And that's the funds that are primarily used to finance affordable housing trust fund uh, projects. That is a source that, that this department would lose with that regard. I think, but again, as a policy, uh, there, there are staff here who may be able to give you the other, but it does not affect the shelters directly. That would be another, uh, there's, there's four funding sources that are part of the consolidated right. plan. Home is one, CDBG is one. Okay, well, uh, regardless of whether or not it affects those 200 shelter beds, it sounds like the consequences are pretty dire. Yes. Uh, yes. And uh, uh, dig us deeper into a hole on homelessness just as we're trying to dig ourselves out. So it's a huge problem. We should yeah. clarify, actually, that the, it's my understanding that the legislation is still pending. The federal legislation has not officially been adopted. So um, this is, uh, based on what we know, this is what we're seeing. However, it's not effective just yet. We expect okay. to have better information by December of this, of this year. Okay, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Chris. Yeah, I have a question about uh, HOPWA funding. Um, the City Housing Authority issued its recommendations for new HOPWA contracts, I believe, in September, um, including a recommendation for APLA to oversee activities for service planning area six. I think these contracts fund crisis housing beds and other supportive services for people with AIDS and people uh, that, that uh, either are homeless or at risk of being homeless, um, and that uh, they'll be managed in the different SPAs by uh, regional housing centers like APLA. And I know APLA leased space already in SPA 6, and they're currently building out those offices, but the, the contracts that were set to uh, begin October 1st have been delayed pending our approval process and that APLA and other entities have no clear idea of when the awards will be finalized. Um, and even the HOPWA staff seems somewhat unclear about where in the approval process the recommendations are. Uh, do we know where they are? And uh, I understand there's a decrease of 333,000 uh, in the HOPWA account. How will that affect all this? It all sounds like a little bit of a mess. I wonder if you all can clarify that. Unfortunately, I'm not familiar with where it is in the process. I do understand that that selection process was being prepared for, for council um, review and, and through a transmittal. I'm, I can fa definitely find out before this report goes to council where that transmittal is. I, I'm, I'm really not 100% sure. This is something that my program staff could help me. Yeah, if you can get us that information before Definitely. this goes to council, that would be great. Thank you. 
All right. Uh, anything else, members, for housing? Okay. Thank you very much. That brings up uh, LAPD. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, so, I don't know if other members are going to have questions, but um, I called this because of the $5.3 million um, <coughs> deficit uh, that, that we're projecting. Mm -hmm. And the, the note that I have in the FSR indicates that that's um, due to um, sworn salary uh, shortfalls due to retirement and replacement of the retirees to keep up with attrition. Correct. Keeping up with attrition by hiring new officers should result in savings, given the fact that we have lower salary levels than we do um, for the retirees. So how is it that we're hitting a $5.37 million deficit? Intuitively, that makes sense. Um, what happened, though, is that the way that the budget was put together, um, they pushed all, most of the hiring in the second half of the fiscal year. In order for us to be able to hire to, to reach 10,000 this fiscal year, we have to do hiring at the beginning of the year to have, we can't have, we, we don't have the capacity to get classes of 70 or 80, which is what it would have to happen in the second half of the year. So they're more evenly distributed at the beginning of the year. So we've been having classes of an average of about 40 each month. And so that's why it's costing more is because they're on the payroll longer. Um, so you actually added additional classes earlier on in the year than had been anticipated. So it's the extra months of being on the clock that exactly. adds to that. All right. So that makes sense. We've bandied about this question for a long time, and I still don't know if I'm, I'm clear on the answer. But in terms of economics, mm -hmm. where, what size training class is optimal in terms uh, of maximizing the cost efficiency and still meeting the department's training needs? 4550 is the optimal number for a okay. class. So by adding these classes, you still retained that optimal level per class. Sim you just simply added more on. Well, what we had to, what we're trying to. We haven't been able to reach that goal every month. So, uh, you know, um, there's been an ongoing issue with getting enough recruits through. And so we're actually down from the beginning of the year. But um, our, our, our goal is, we, we've been, Averaging about 45 people a month is, okay. I guess, to answer your question. Yes. Okay. That, yeah. so we're pretty much hitting the, hitting the goal. Not every yeah. time, but right. on average. Right. On average. Goal. Right. Right. I'm concerned to hear you say that the department is having trouble, again, filling the classes right. at times, because I thought that that issue had been resolved with the salary adjustment. Um, partially. Um, it, it's, but it's nationwide. Every, um, agencies are having a hard time filling positions, and um, I just came back from a conference with my colleagues, and they're, everybody's having the same problem. The other agencies are now hiring, so we're competing against, you know, the CHP, the Sheriff's Department, other California agencies. So it's just a matter of, of being able to get people who qualify and get them into the academy. So as everybody else's budget situation is improving and they start ramping up again, there's a lot more slots open for the same number of potential, exactly. same pool yeah. of talent. Yeah, yes. Uh, all right. Anything else? Oh, um, I, I don't really have a question. I just want to signal a concern that I want to come back to probably by mid-year. Okay. Um, and that is um, some deployment uh, concerns that I have. Uh, the, the chief's model this year involved um, beefing up deployment downtown in order to have surge capacity downtown and be mm -hmm. able to deploy. Right. Um, I am beginning to have concerns about the impact on patrol in the divisions, and in particular North Hollywood Division, um, where uh, my officers are frequently called upon for special event response and things like that. We're pretty thinly, we feel pretty thinly staffed, and I suspect that everybody else <coughs> feels the same way about their divisions. Right. Yeah. Um, and particularly as we're evaluating our response to homelessness, 
and we know that the vast majority of the expenditure that we spend right now on homelessness is spent through your department. Mm -hmm. um, if we are ever going to get to a point where we can sort of transfer some of that responsibility out of the department and into um, into other agencies as a as an appropriate response, I think we still have to have people on the ground who can deal with uh, the increasing problem. We have, you know, in some divisions we have homeless cars. We don't have them in every division, right. and those are folks who really need to understand that beat and understand how to how to deal with that situation. And and as we're getting thinner on patrol, it's harder and harder for for the captains in each division to do that. Right. So th I just wanted to highlight that as a concern because I haven't fully thought it through. I haven't discussed it with the department yet at length, but I want to do that so that by mid-year maybe we can think about Would you like me to have one of um, one of the chiefs contact you regarding the deployment issues? Sh yes, we will do that, but, okay. but I want us collectively also to start okay. thinking about that in time for the mid-year. Yeah. That, the exact same point I was going to raise, and I'm very concerned about that, and, and I said, as you said, a lot of divisions are feel, feeling it, but we in the West Valley feel like it's particularly acute. You know, the Topanga Division has been down a uh, number of officers, and uh, we just we know that it's, in, it's a citywide problem, but maybe looking at the deployment and as we don't have enough positions, where is, how is that being implemented across, across the board, and, and how are the sort of the areas that are further flung from the, the center uh, being impacted? Because it, it certainly feels like, and I hear from my constituents quite a bit, mm -hmm. um, that the understaffing seems to be happening more in, in our area. Now, I know everyone probably feels the same, so I don't want to take away from that, but it's, it's a very real concern. I'm glad you, you raised it. I was going to try to put a pin in it. You did it in a very diplomatic way, so I'm just going to add on to what Mr. Kerkorian said and said something that we're going to, to want to look into very carefully these next weeks, months. Okay. Particularly because we're a little geographically isolated out in the valley. We're right. distant from the center. Yeah. And so if our officers are going, you know, to be deployed elsewhere, that leaves us even thinner than we were to begin with, and uh, okay. and we don't have the benefit of getting that surge in the other direction so much. Yeah, and when we have, I mean, a lot of delicate economic stuff, like the the new village in, in Topanga, they're expecting more people than Disneyland every year, and, um, you know, we haven't seen uh, an increase in the number of officers yet. We know that the number of people uh, and the is going way up in terms of the people that are in that area, coming to that area, 100 new restaurants and stores, you know, overnight were added. Wow. Uh, and we want to make sure, and it wasn't quite overnight, but it was in the last year, mm -hmm. and just opened up. Um, we want to make sure that, that that becomes an economic generator and a few bad incidents that could go completely the other direction, and that would Absolutely. hurt the, the city overall economically. Correct. Mr. Krebs. Yeah, I, I would ditto that, and I think in my district, which has uh, very low coverage, we're not necessarily seeing... Uh, you know, a massive increase in violent crimes, but we're certainly seeing <coughs> an, emboldening, an emboldening of criminals who are doing knock and grab household burglaries and auto burglaries and all that, because uh, I think there's, there's probably a general awareness that we don't have a lot, a lot of law enforcement staffing. So I, I think this is hitting us all in different ways, but uh, uh, clearly we're, we're all being impacted. Mr. Yeah, well, I'm going to definitely jump on this bandwagon. We now have probably more council members concerned about this issue in this room than we have patrolling some of our neighborhoods. Uh, this is a big issue. I mean, it's been a big issue near the airport. I've been hearing about it in the southern part of my district. In the northern part of my district, which mirrors Mr. Koretz's, the same phenomenon. And when the Times did its crime mapping uh, a few months ago, Central got a lot of attention for the increases there, but I had equal increases in, in, in my area, equal to Central, and uh, this has exacerbated it. I think it's a, a problem not just of deployment. I actually think it's a problem of, 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 of philosophy. I think the approach of uh, suppression, uh, putting more officers into suppression, crime suppression, as opposed to neighborhood policing, is a short-term strategy with, with long-term consequences that are not positive. So I was, I've been concerned about this since I heard it announced, the, the, the deployment of folks to Metro. I was told at the time, you'll, you'll see the Metro folks coming back because of Venice in that area. I haven't. Uh, and what I'd like to see is some 
stats about uh, the number of officers uh, who are actually on patrol. If you take, because my understanding is like metro units, if, if metro is in, is at Venice Beach, for instance, and there is an incident elsewhere in Venice, they don't get the 911 call. That's at least what I've been told by officers, mm -hmm. is metro doesn't roll out in response to that. So it doesn't help in a lot of situations. So if you, if you take out all the folks in robbery homicide, you take out all the folks in specialized units, you take out all the folks in metro, what percentage of the department is actually in patrol? Mm -hmm. And is there any metric of but how that has changed over the past 20 years or so? That's a, something I'd like to see. Okay. Yeah, thank you. All right. Anything else for PD? Yes, Mr. Kress. Uh A couple of questions I also asked the fire department, but uh, especially 911, probably more appropriate for LAPD since you get the initial calls. <coughs> How are we doing? How many uh, complaints do we receive about people not getting immediate service on 911? Are we getting quick answers? Are we having times where people have to wait a minute or two on the line? Um, what, what's our response right now? I don't have those statistics. We can get them to you if you would like. Um, Anybody have a sense of where we are? If not, maybe you can just get us the statistics before this comes to council. Okay. And the same question about uh, claims. Uh, uh, LAPD also has a rate, I believe, of over 50% of officers filing a claim within a several year period. Um, so if, if, uh, you could let me know what, what we're doing to try and combat that and on the LAPD side, that would also be good. And that's it. All right. Just to add, yes, his question on the 911. So when someone calls on a cell phone versus a landline, it goes through a different process, is that right? I believe it gets picked up by the CHP. Because yeah, that's sometimes the issue, too, is that I hear really long wait times on mm -hmm on a 911 call and then I ask about it and they say, well, that was a cell phone call. Um, this is maybe a longer term issue yeah. to look at, but more and more people, LA city folks are using cell phones even in their own home. Right. A lot of people have cut loose the landline. Right. Um, and I'm worried that our response, our LAPD response is being impacted by that trend mm -hmm. um, because we're not getting the call necessarily directly or it's going to the CHP and I mean you know I've heard 10 15 minute waits um, you know where where we actually had an incident with someone in someone in my office who had a situation a relative and they had this extremely long wait um, and they finally had to literally drive to the police station because wow. um, they, they lived not far from it and, it, and I think that was another one, it was a cell phone. So it doesn't get wrapped up in these numbers when, even if the numbers come back and we say, hey, it's only a 10 second wait, if the cell phones are going to CHP and that's 15 minutes, then most people don't know that, that there's two different right. processes. So I don't know, I'm raising it now just because we were talking about it, but uh, I'd like to figure out a response, of, uh, an answer to that, of, of how we, how we get those folks routed into our system because they're not being served well in the other system. Okay. Mr. Kretz? Yeah, one, one last question. Uh, I know LAPD is, is a little short on funds and we'll be trying to reduce the, that deficit as the year goes on. Um, my sense is that some of that might be in cutting back on, on non-sworn officers in the department. Uh, if that happens, will that mean that sworn officers will again be doing more clerical work than they were rather than being out on patrol and does that actually save money? Is that a rhetorical question? Uh, well, it's somewhat <laughs> of a, not, not entirely rhetorical. No, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, the, it, to come up with a $5 million shortfall, we're going to have to make cuts, uh, we're going to have to impact it's going to impact um, promotions and pay grade advancements on the SWORD side, and it's going to have to reduce the number of civilians that we're going to be able to hire this year. Um, we're making a big push to hire detention officers and um, print specialists this year. A lot of um, Now, the print specialist is a different story that's been addressed by this, this council, but the detention officers um, is an important initiative. We want to fill all, all of our vacancies this fiscal year. 
um, and we'll have to make a cut in the number of positions. We also have a lot of common classes um, that need need to have positions filled. Our attrition is up on the civilian side. You know, personnel mentioned that they've been getting all these exams out, and they have because we're losing a lot of people who are getting promoted to other departments. And um, we're actually down uh, 21 civilians from just the beginning of the fiscal year because people are making, you know, getting promotion, promotions and some retirements. But I, myself, I've lost five employees already this fiscal year due to promotions, which is wonderful, but still um, it has an impact. So, yes, we're going to have, there's going to be an impact on um, operations if we have to curtail civilian hiring. So will, will part of that sort of be taken care of by nature, as you said, because a lot of openings are happening and will take a while to fill, or will you actually need to proactively cut back on, on It'll be a combination well? of the two to, to find $5 million. Okay. So I want to follow up on the point you were just making about um, the detention officers, because there was a for a time after the starting salary of sworn was reduced, mm -hmm. an argument could actually be made that a starting uh, entry-level police officer was actually a less expensive jailer than a civilian would have been. Correct. That's no longer the case. Correct. Because we've restored those salary levels. So given the fact that we're having to ramp up hiring and we're having trouble doing that mm -hmm. to ramp up hiring to meet the needs of attrition isn't it easier and cheaper to ramp up our hiring of civilian jailers in order to move our trained police officers out of the jail and onto the streets easier than hiring the, than the competition that you described earlier oh. to hire new police officers yeah no and we're doing that we are hiring this the detention officers this fiscal year um, I believe that the um, we're at the end of a list right now and that the personnel department is going to have a list out in January. And so right after that, we are planning on uh, the push for the second half of the fiscal year. But, yeah, that's our goal is to get, get as many of those police officers out of the jail and working out on the streets. So maybe I misunderstood because I thought in response to Mr. Kretz's question, you said that in order to make up this $5.3 million deficit, there's going to have to be cutbacks in civilian hiring, right. including civilian detention officers no, is that well it's all wrapped up we, we have a hiring plan um, for civilians for the fiscal year and included in that are detention officers that's a priority but we're going to other d positions are going to fall by the wayside that we won't be able to fill um, in deference to being able to hire the detention okay. officers and the so okay. no no we're not going to cut back on the number of detention officers that okay. we're going to hire it's resulting in cost savings to do that. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Very good. Anything else, members? No. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. I think, members, that's the last of our departmental uh, inquiries. Unless I missed anything, I think I kept careful enough notes. Um, I just had a couple more questions for the CAO that I'd forgotten. Um, <coughs> I had a couple as well. Good. Okay. So, one is uh, again just to highlight the issue. I don't want a response now, but we have $20 million projected shortfall in the liability claims account. This early in the fiscal year, that's a wildly uh, inaccurate number. We're just kind of guessing about that because you're projecting not on based on actual cases so much, but trends. Right. And actual a single actual case could throw that completely out of whack. So what I would like to um, make sure that we do is that by the mid-level F, uh, by the mid-year FSR, um, I'd like to have a more detailed analysis from the city attorney on expectations for actual cases uh, that, it, that the city attorney intends to have resolved by the end of the fiscal year so that we can get a much more accurate number about that and make an assessment during, during mid-year. Um, second, on the, the refund of the SWERF, because of the bulky item illegal <laughs> dumping issue. I, I get the issue, um, and, but I'm wondering if we have to resolve that all in a single year. Could we, for example, um, instead of refunding 3.63 million uh, out of the general fund this year, could we acknowledge the obligation, treat it as 
whatever you want to call it, a loan from the SWERF to the general fund that will be repaid in three equal increments or something so that we can stretch that out over more than one fiscal year just to give it a little bit more flexibility for this budget year. Is that, is that something we could do or would that not be advisable? Well, we're, we're proposing something similar in relation to overtime costs that instead of the department had requested additional funding for overtime um, and we're requesting that instead of you know, uh, out budgeting an additional amount that they basically seek reimbursement. And, and once they know exactly whether it's worth or general fund obligation, between now and the time the, the FSR goes to full council, we could try to get a more specific answer as to whether we could break it up that way. Okay. That'd be great. Up on that right. question. Yeah. So, so if we do find out that we can use SWERF funds down the road, is there a way, and we end up paying for some of this with general fund, is there a way to retroactively reimburse the general fund? Um, it, it all gets reconciled at some point, so perhaps we'll look into that as well. So as a, as a long-term issue, it is what it is. It's not, we're not going to disadvantage ourselves one way or the other by going down. A, it's more a strategic question of finance management than it is a question of who ultimately pays, you know, which fund ultimately pays. It, it's, it's a legal interpretation as to what's eligible or not. So um, in other areas, it's not unusual that the general fund gets reimbursed or the other way around. So there's a reconciliation that occurs um, sometimes even after the fiscal year, but during the reconciliation of the books. But we could find out if that could be as part of this process for this current fiscal year. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just had a couple questions on, on the homelessness initiative. Uh, and first of all, I want to thank you for your, your, your work on it, uh, even before the, the, the full council was, was, was really working on it. You were there. Um, so what you're recommending here is that we create the account in the UB that the $15 million goes into. And then through separate action, we'll be making the actual allocations recommended by the mayor, presumably. Um, has there been any think it, thinking, any thought yet to um, who will be administering the recommended five million for um, the the veterans? Those details still need to be worked out, and so that's why we're recommending that the money get put aside in the in the the UB that was actually already created. Right. Um, and we still need to work out specifically how it's administered and by whom. I presume the same answer for the, yes. the rapid for rehousing and the storage correct. and everything. And it's part of, obviously, the larger conversation that's being held by your committee. Right. Uh, during last year's budget deliberation, sort of at the end of it, we set aside $1 million in the UB for homelessness. Are, right. are you including that in this, or is that separate from this? It's separate, right? Uh, the, I believe uh, the thought was that the one million would be part of uh, the uh, winter shelter program right. that's pending. So the if that action goes forward, then right. the one million is taken right. care of. Okay. All right. Um, then that answers my questions. That's exactly what I was hoping to hear. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Kretz. <laughs> yeah, I have a question about the same thing. Uh, has the council in any way voted a a clear path to this $100 million and a commitment to do it? No. no, the motion's been introduced. It was discussed at the last homeless committee meeting. Um, the direction of the committee was to create the account. The committee is uh, working towards developing a comprehensive strategy, um, so hopefully to be completed sometime either later this year or early in January. And then at that point, that strategy will help inform how to best um, spend those that 100 million. The the challenge has been, as you could see in the FSR, is is identifying the funds to create the 100 million dollar account. Um, the motion wasn't specific as to the time frame, whether it's this fiscal year or next fiscal year, is broad enough to assume a number of fiscal years. Um, but the actual plan itself is currently being developed. The CLA and my offices are based on the direction from the committee are, is putting the plan together. And I should elaborate on that a little bit. Um, the, 
the, the county is on a parallel track simultaneously engaged in developing uh, a really multi-pronged strategy and they're doing a very thorough job putting that together. The, the city is now working on a parallel track so that we will not be sort of competing with each other or racing to be first. We're, bo we're both going to sort of have our plans or our, our strategies developed uh, in unison uh, probably in, in January. And one of the things the committee's looking at is making sure that the way we recommend allocations of, of our money fills gaps that the county isn't filling or uh, buys in to expand successful programs the county's doing and stuff like that. Well, and if I can just chime in since you raised the issue, Mr. Kretz, and I think you've said a couple of times today, uh, Mr. Santana, $100 million. The council has not at all committed $100 million uh, to this purpose. The council has not at all committed $100 million of new money, certainly, to, to this purpose. The motion provided a ballpark of $100 million, but it might be more, it might be less. It would be premature until Mr. Bonin and his colleagues and others develop policy uh, on how we address this before we could even begin to put a price tag on, on what this is. I think the point of the motion was to emphasize, first of all, the, the initial urgency, the, the state of emergency, the need to deal with the, uh, the winter sheltering, but then also to kind of lay a path forward to spending our money in a more effective way, first of all, and increasing our commitment to solving the problem. And that's a job, that's a policy decision that has to be made before it can be made as a, as a budget decision. So it, I don't want anybody to be misled by the idea that, you know, there's suddenly a hundred million dollars that we're, we're putting into this that's new money. May, may, I, may I make sure that nobody's misled in the other direction? Yeah. Because uh, I, I see Dakota typing furiously. Uh, and I want to make sure our friends up the street at the County Hall of Administration, uh, while they hear that, also understand that uh, a big chunk of the council and the mayor have committed to helping find the hundred million so we can we can do this. Uh, the county is expecting us to be an equal partner, not an equal partner, but a, a willing partner in this. The county is going to be giving up a lot more money than we ever are. Most of this is in their bailiwick, uh, but that we're willing to work with them on this. And in fact, today we're taking a pretty significant yep. step forward in this <coughs> FSR by yeah, setting right. up an account, putting $15 million uh, towards those solutions. That's a pretty major step yes. uh, in the right direction, Damn in addition right. to it addressing the winter shelters. Yeah, Mr. Kretz. Well, I, I, I do have some concerns. I mean, among them, my sense, other than El Nino, that this isn't necessarily any more of a crisis than it was 10 years ago when people were talking about solving it also. The numbers aren't that different. I think we may all be seeing it more because there may be fewer people downtown and more spread out among the cities. So. For those of us for whom it wasn't as big an issue, now it is, so it may seem more like a crisis. But my feeling is it became a crisis in the press, there became more consciousness, and there's a big press to act and do something. But I don't want us to do what I think we've done so far, which is to say, all right, we're going to spend $100 million, we're going to throw money at the problem, then we'll figure out what the plan is. I really want us to have a very coherent plan before we start spending much. Um, I want it to be more of a long-term plan so we actually can see ourselves solving the problem. Um, I'm hesitant to just throw money at it, and especially this year when we start. Um, I want it to be money that actually is a long-term solution to the problem. If we spend a lot of money just housing people, obviously with El Nino, we need to get people off the street. So I understand that. But if it wasn't an El Nino year, I would be less interested in temporary shelter for more people and more interested um, in spending money in a more long-term way that solves the problem. Because I know people have talked about solving this for decades, certainly as long as I've been in, in elective office and involved in government, which is in 30 years, but long before that. Um, I, I think we need to, to look at the different components of the homeless and try to separate their needs and solve them one by one. Um, I think there's a lot to this. So I want to see a lot more serious strategic planning before 
uh, certainly I'd be willing to spend more than our initial $15 million. So I don't want us to just throw the money because we feel the urgency. I'd even rather put it aside in the UB and spend $200 million in two years when we actually know the best path. So I want to be very careful about that. Mr. Chair? In fact, that, that strategic planning is exactly what's going on right now with the policy development that's going on with the Homeless Committee. And that, that's my only point is that that's a, yeah. that's, they're doing that and the budget issue is secondary to the work that, and, that they're doing. And, and I, I just need, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, I, I need yeah. to say two things in, in, in response. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. Is that it, exactly the kind of strategic plan that Mr. Koretz is asking for is what's being developed both by the city and the county. Uh, it's multi-pronged. It is looking at the entire continuum of care from sidewalks to permanent supportive housing, everything in between. It is looking at the range of different types of homelessness, not just chronic homelessness, but episodic homelessness, victims of domestic violence, teenage runaways. It is looking at the whole range of it, and it's also looking at how do we stop people from becoming homeless. But I'm, I'm sorry, I need to take urgent, urgent and strong exception to the idea that this is not a crisis or that or the numbers aren't worse or that this has been created by the press. Uh, the numbers in two years have gone up dramatically, 12%. At a time when Los Angeles, over the past five or six years, has housed more people than other states have. Um, we've seen numbers that 13,000 people may be coming homeless every month. Uh, we heard reports last week that, there, that nobody is really tracking folks who get out of prison and become homeless, or get out of hospitals and become homeless. This is a huge crisis, and um, I, I think the numbers are getting dramatically worse, and I think it's demanded our attention because of that. I know it's been a long-standing problem, and it has been not solved and neglected in turn over the years, but it, it is getting worse. And even in the population that is increasing, uh, the numbers of people who are uh, chronically homeless on the street, who are mentally ill on the street, are increasing. And we haven't had a pipeline over the past few years that has sufficiently caught someone as they became homeless. So we've actually had a system that has inadvertently told someone who's recently become homeless, wait until you've been homeless for another year and a half where you have a more severe disability and then we'll, we'll, we'll treat you. It, 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 it really is a crisis and um, I, I don't think this is something that the, the, the press created. I think it's something that everybody in all of our neighborhoods sees. And, and one thing I would add to this conversation is that the, the theoretical hundred million is really a drop in the bucket when you start looking at the systemic problems that we're all talking about and that we've got to work on creating the policy to justify the spending and make it appropriate spending. So I sort of agree with, with everyone who's, who's spoken. I mean, the, the problem is unconscionable. We've got to move with, with haste. But if, you know, as we, as we keep taking a step back and looking at the, the bigger picture, um, 100 million is is nothing. I mean, you, we we could barely with 100 million. I don't even think we keep up with the affordable housing units that we're losing on a reg, on an annual basis because of all sorts of reasons, whether it's Airbnb or or any number of things. We're losing more units than we're creating, and the 100 million, even if we just spent it on building supportive housing, uh, would get us wouldn't get us near solving the problem. So we've got to be looking at this as a bigger policy objective and and thinking big in terms of the money and. Frankly, at the end of the day, the hundred, you know, the theoretical hundred million is, is, not even near adequate of what, yep. what we're probably going to end up spending. Agreed. Could I but add one more thing? Members, yes, but I don't want this to be an okay. extended discussion about homelessness because okay. we have a homelessness committee that's dealing with that right now. And I agree. It's not Just even one really more thing. A part of what we're talking about, the, except that we're setting aside fifteen million dollars to address the problem. I know, but yes, Mr. Kretz. But the financial <coughs> piece of it, I mean, there there may be many things that we could do that don't cost a lot of money. And those would be the ones I'd be looking at first. Dealing with Airbnb, dealing with the Ellis Act, things that are decimating affordable housing. Um, those are all important steps to look at and don't necessarily cost us a whole lot of money. Um, I think there are a lot of steps that could be done inexpensively. And I would hope that we jump on, on many of those first before we start making money commitments that we don't necessarily have in a city that hasn't fully recovered yet from its terrible recession of a few years ago. The complexity of the problem is such that everyone here is correct. 
So, so that's, that's why I think we, we're, we're well served by having the homelessness committee. I'm, first of all, it's really important that we have a homelessness committee now. And we've focused our efforts on policy development that will create sustainable solutions. So um, I'm looking forward to getting those reports back and addressing it in council, and then we'll deal with it here in budget. So um, anything else for the CAO members? Okay. Then um, we have, we're going to hear from Mr. Spindler uh, next, and then we have um, some uh, amendments that the CAO has. Uh, have they been circulated? Yes. CAO's amendments have been circulated? Okay. Yes. Mr. Spindler. Yeah. So it's good one of these short meetings like today. I managed to look at the budget. Well, it looks like. Uh, you have a little DWP problem because if you don't get your transfers, $786.2 million in transfers that you're stealing from the ratepayers of the DWP to your budget may no longer exist. So I think you guys know you're going to lose that in court. But now I noticed you're stealing from the police officers now. Jack Fry versus City of LA. Health subsidies. You're stealing from the cops and the firefighters, $67 million and $16 million a year in unfunded pensions. And they had to go to court and sue over health care. Will you give the cops back their health benefits? For God's sakes, they're entitled to it. That's what the judge said. Do it now. All right, thank you. Um, members, if there's no further discussion, um, Unless there's objection, we'll approve the CAO's recommendation. Cover. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Uh, Jacob Bucks the CAO. Sorry. Uh, on the addendum that yes. we have presented, yes. uh, we needed to make a technical correction. We have a the typographical addendum. error to the, the addendum. Redhead. I apologize. Redhead. Not at all. Not it's at all. on attachment uh, number 16. We have two titles on that addendum. Uh, one of them indicates that the fiscal year it refers to as 2014-15, and the other one says it's 15-16. I would like to make the correction to reflect that that attachment refers to the 2015-16 MICLA equipment list. All right. Thank you. So with the CAO's uh, amendments as amended, <laughs> so moved. if there's no objection, we'll go ahead and approve the recommendations in, in the FSR. Um, thank you very much. So that concludes the special agenda, brings us back into the regular agenda, and um, we're going to take up next item number seven. Mr. Kretz, um, so who is going to, okay. All right, so Mr. Kretz, I'm going to turn this over to you and uh, uh, hopefully a brief question. Um, a while back we uh, passed a motion to basically attempt to recover uh, some of the money that many of us thought we were uh, cheated out of in a way by a couple of the banks that we deal with and uh, if not at least attempt to uh, not do further business with them. Um, one is uh, the Bank of New York Mellon Trust Company, which uh, we have this uh, uh, item to continue working with them on before us, so that would seem to be in conflict with that. Is there uh, any way for us to avoid uh, having to pass this motion? Uh, good afternoon. Um, Saul Romo with the Office of Finance. Um, Council Member, I think at the time that the motion was presented, it was presented in such a way that the City Council was pondering terminating any current business with Bank of New York Mellon or any future business with Bank of New York Mellon. But to our understanding, we don't think that a decisive decision or instruction to the departments to suspend any business dealings with Bank of New York Mellon was made. Um, I think the issue at that time that you were considering um, is a different business matter than what is before you today. And so I think that if you uh, made a decision to uh, adopt the, re the recommendation to allow the department to continue a one-year extension of the current agreement, I don't think that necessarily they're inconsistent with each other simply because of the nature of the types of activities that we're talking about. Well, it, it actually would be 
exactly on point in terms of not continuing to do business with them. The question for me is, do we have any other choice or not? What, what would our alternative be if we were to vote this down? Or is there an alternative? Tom, Tom Juarez, Office of Finance. Um, Councilman, there, there is no other option at this point. This, this option before you is on the current contract that we're looking to extend um, until we can get the new custodian in place uh, in about a year from now. So did other people bid on this? Was there any other interest? That's a separate matter. This, this is about the contract extension that we're talking about today. The, the RFP process, which I believe you're uh, referring to, um, there were, there, that was, there was one bank that did bid on the, the contract. Um, we had others interested, but they simply did not uh, submit a bid. And we are required to maintain this service. Yes. Correct. It's by law. Do we, do we have a process that would allow us to select someone else during this one year period? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, well, it doesn't sound like we have a whole lot of options. Uh, I think I'm going to vote against this anyway on principle, but uh, I don't know that I can honestly recommend uh, another choice. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so then if there's uh, no, well, I guess there will be objections. So um, the recommendation would be to approve the contract extension and Mr. Kress will be recorded as a no vote. Yes. And if there's no other objection, that'll be the action of the committee. Thanks. Thank you very much. All right. So we can now proceed into uh, our closed session. Dion, that's all right. Um, so we're going to take, take up items one, two, three, four, and five in closed session. So, but before we do, Mr. Spindler has comments. So um, let's go ahead and take Mr. Spindler's comments on one. You know, Mr. Spindler, I'm sorry. I'm going to give you um, five minutes. Okay. He's already for the, for free. Yeah. Um, and so, which would you like to, to, whichever ones of those items you would like to speak yeah. on in uh, the remaining two minutes would be. Yeah. One through five. Great. Okay. You know what? Three minutes because one was a special agenda item. Yeah. So okay. Three minutes on all of them. Okay. Well, item one, first of all, uh, very sorry to all the lawyers that have had to wait here so long. I know you're anxious to get paid. So item number one was this horrible situation. This nice lady, Annette Yezagelian, is going to finally be paid for her injuries. The city is guilty, guilty, guilty. And please pay her forthwith. Number two, CPR for Skid Row. Well, I mean, this is typical. Demonstrators outside on the sidewalk engaging in First Amendment rights. But the city forgot there's a First Amendment right on, to, to be on the sidewalk. You forgot. So now when you're down at Skid Row, you get your head bashed in and if you talk against the system. But see, we have a federal court system. So they didn't go to the little court. They went to the big fat civil court of... 2 semicolon 11 cv 6274 JFW, that is a United States District Court case number. That means outside counsel has to be appointed because there's nobody that works for the city attorney's office, including Mike Fuhr, that's registered to practice before the United States Central District. You have to have a brain to do that, so they can't do that. You have to get that outside counsel. You'll settle that. Then we get to number three, James Kabosh versus City of Los Angeles. Inverse condemnation. This is becoming more common. You get your little developers and all your little projects. You start digging. There's erosion. And then you go to the homeowner and tell him that he needs to fix it. He gets an engineer and finds out the city's the one causing the excavation and discharge of the dirt on the property. So this nice man, Mr. Kabosh, needs to be paid because you destroyed his property. 
Then we have number four is a bankruptcy case, which you're playing with another federal court. I wouldn't do it. For this nice company called Pacifica of the Valley. Now, with a name like that, do you really think they owe the city anything? Of course not. And it's in bankruptcy. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be discharged. You're not going to get paid. And then finally, we get the, the Ready Golf Center. Yes, the poor little golf people, they go against the Board of Recreation and Parks. All you got to do is go to the Van Nuys Golf Course and see they made it into a cemetery. There's no business there because the Board of Recreation and Parks does not know how to utilize its properties. So these people have to sue. Finally, thank God, they hire these good lawyers. Go in there, lawyers, and rape these suckers for all you can get them for. God bless you. All right, thank you. Now, actually, before we begin closed session, members, unless there's discussion about item number nine, um, there are uh, some amendments that have been circulated by the CLA's office. If that's going to require discussion, we'll wait. But if not, uh, I'd like to just go ahead and get it out of the way. For it. So. so I'm going to let him go. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, then uh, I don't think we need to hear the report. If there's no objection on item number nine, we'll go ahead and approve the recommendations uh, contained in the departmental reports and the amendments uh, circulated by the CLA. So with that, that'll be the action of the committee. Now we can go into closed session. Thank you for your patience. I apologize for that little hiccup with closed session. Be unless the city attorney has priority on it. <laughs>